thank you for joining me in that moment of silence. And I think it also adds a layer of relevance to the conversation that we will be having in regard to advanced nuclear technology and um, the ability for this technology to, to be put to use in defense capacities. It certainly is not a part of our agenda for today, but it does add a, a different backdrop that I think gives some additional relevance to what we're talking through. Again, thank you. I am Bonnie Loomis, Managing Director for South Carolina for E4 Carolinas, and I have been with this organization for a little over a year. I joined in July of 2020 as E4 Carolinas took responsibility for administration of the former South Carolina Clean Energy Business Alliance. And with me came along two individuals who will be joining us this morning in our first session, Weston Adams and Brian Stone. And we have come together with our board chair, Jeff Merrifield, under the umbrella of E4 Carolinas and as a part of the activities of the E4 Carolinas South Carolina Clean Energy Industries Task Force to bring you this session today. And it is a deeper dive into the conversation of advanced nuclear than we held back in the fall, or, or I guess it was winter, almost winter, of 2020 during the South Carolina Clean Energy Conference that was held virtually last year. We are you know, well beyond a year of virtual activities, and I think everyone is familiar with how to navigate the WebEx platform at this time. You see here a illustration of some links or buttons, icons that you would have at the bottom of your screen, and these are how you will function through the day. We ask that you keep yourself on mute unless you are one of our speakers who is speaking at the time. And it also, you're invited to take your video off from a bandwidth perspective, many of us have found that that works well. And please chat questions to our panel members, to our speakers. You are welcome to chat those to everyone or to just one of the individuals. I, I would suggest that as a speaker is speaking, it's hard to also pay attention to the chat. So it may help to chat to everyone so that others among the panel may be able to see that question and possibly address it um, for you. We have a robust agenda with four separate sessions. And as we talked through this, we felt like we needed an initial session to provide some overall context and a little bit of color as it relates to the history and the, the current state of nuclear technology in South Carolina. And we're then going to take a very specific look at this technology as it's being deployed across the globe and then bring it back with a, a session focusing on deploying the technology in the US and in particular in the Carolinas. And then we'll close with a session related to the work that we are doing in E4 Carolinas to support the next generation of nuclear workforce. As we realize that is a subject that many of our nuclear companies are grappling with um, a need to ensure the pipeline is full of skilled individuals who are capable of, of taking this technology and this industry into the next decade and, and well beyond that. As you may recall from the email that you received through Eventbrite with the link to participate today, we have linked bios of all participants in that email. So you are welcome to um, use that email to click through to LinkedIn or websites that have biographical information on these individuals. And um, each of the moderators will just share a brief bit of background on, on themselves and the speakers in their session as they begin their session. The first session does indeed um, come from our, our board members, and we're very excited to bring you these three individuals, Jeff Merrifield, partner and energy sector leader at Pillsbury Law, who serves as the board chair for E4 Carolinas. And I know 
in his slides will share a little bit of his nuclear specific background with you. And Weston Adams, who is a partner and co-chair of the energy industry in energy industry group with Nelson Mullins and Brian Stone, president and CEO of Lockhart Power. Both Weston and Brian are here in South Carolina and they co-chair the E4 Carolina's South Carolina Clean Energy Industries Task Force. So Jeff, without further ado, I'm going to hand the baton to you. Well, Bonnie, thank you very much. And I'd like to join you in welcoming uh, all of our members uh, to the session we're gonna have today. We hope it to be uh, lively and instructive and, and leave you at the end with a better understanding of advanced nuclear technologies and how they may be deployed and used in South Carolina and elsewhere for the benefit of, of the people of the state and the region. Um, with that, Bonnie, you can go to the next slide. And next from there. Yeah, just a, a few things for those of you who don't know me. Um, I am the energy section lead for Pillsbury Law Firm, which is based in DC. Um, I'm coming to you today from Davidson, North Carolina. Uh, in my background, I was a commissioner of the US Nuclear Regulatory Commission um, from 1998 through 2007. Uh, I also was a senior vice president for the Shaw Group, uh, which was responsible for building a variety of nuclear power plants uh, and other generation facilities. Uh, we were also involved with the MOX a fuel fabrication plant at Savannah River National Lab. Uh, in addition to the work I do as chairman of E4, I also chair the Advanced nu uh, Nuclear Working Group of a DC-based association called uh, the Nuclear Industry Council. Um, our law firm is the oldest nuclear law firm uh, in the world, and we uh, practice on virtually every continent uh, with utilities, suppliers, uh, countries, and others in the nuclear supply chain. Next, next slide. I think in, in, in context, I, there is a significant amount of interest in Washington DC and around the world these days for the development and deployment of advanced nuclear technologies. The driving force for that is clearly the need uh, to reduce carbon output. Uh, and as you can see here from this slide, there's a variety of US uh, power companies which have made pledges to achieve anywhere between 80 and 100% carbon free generation by 2050. Uh, now, many of those uh, very same utilities will be making significant investments in renewables to meet that goal. Um, but one of the issues that I have had discussions with many uh, utility executives is that last 20% uh, that is difficult to achieve and really does need 24 7 base load power uh, to make the system work. And that's where advanced nuclear certainly uh, potentially serve a role. Next slide. So when we talk about advanced nuclear reactors, we're, we're talking about a variety of different uh, designs. And I apologize for the nomenclature, but I thought it was important to put into context um, what some of these terms meant. Um, you'll hear the term micro reactors. These are reactors that could be deployed uh, either in very remote locations or uh, potentially with the military. And these are typically uh, less than 10 megawatts uh, in generation. There are small scale reactors. Those are typically between 10 megawatts and 300 megawatts. And then the larger scale reactors, which are greater than 300 megawatts electric. Um, sometimes you'll hear the term SMR, small modular reactor. And that uh, refers not only to its size, but also to the notion uh, that many of the components associated with that plant can be built in a factory setting uh, and then transported to the site for, for fabrication. Uh, there are a variety of different types of reactor designs that are being utilized. Uh, some do use the traditional uh, light water reactor technologies. That's currently what we have in South and North Carolina. And all of the nuclear power plants currently operating in North America, in, in the United States, I should say today, um, do utilize uh, light water as a coolant and moderator. Uh, the next generation of advanced nuclear plants also incorporates a variety of technologies that actually had their roots in the 1950s uh, in many of the DOE national laboratories, but are being fo brought forward now because of the flexibility and enhanced safety characteristics that they include. Uh, these include high temperature gas reactors, uh, liquid metal cooled or fast reactors, and molten salt reactors, all of which have been utilized uh, in the DOE complex um, for many decades, but those technologies are, are currently being deployed for civilian use. Uh, they're innovative, uh, but certainly have a lot of history. 
I would note the picture on the on the right hand side of the slide is the shipping port plant that was actually a Westinghouse facility and was the first commercial nuclear power plant and it was an SMR it was about 50 megawatts uh, in Pennsylvania. Next slide. Uh, there are a large number of companies that are members of E4 who find themselves here in the Carolinas who are involved with the uh, development uh, and deployment of advanced nuclear technologies. Um, you're going to hear later today about some of the efforts we have underway uh, to bring these companies together and others uh, to really drive innovation and drive economic development in South and North Carolina uh, as we move these technologies further in, into the field. Next slide. So what are some of the technologies that are represented? And I do want to footnote uh, ahead of time, this is only a representation. There are, according to Third Way, uh, as many as 70 different companies out there that are developing uh, advanced nuclear power uh, technologies. Um, this group are those which have received uh, a bit more notoriety because of government funding or selection uh, by various companies. Um, beginning at the top, New Scale Reactor, uh, this is a NRC approved design. Um, it's been selected for deployment uh, on the lands of the Idaho National Laboratory to provide power for Utah, uh, Utah Associated Municipal Power District. Uh, each one of those modules has a capacity of 77 megawatts, and that can be uh, configured in, in a variety of, of sizes. We'll hear more about that uh, from one of our speakers later today. Uh, next is the GE Hitachi BWRX 300. Uh, that's a design that was originated in Wilmington, North Carolina. Uh, it's about 300 megawatts. It's one of three designs that have been designated by Ontario Power Generation, uh, Canada's largest nuclear utility, for potential selection uh, later in 2022. Uh, they have uh, uh, several documents from the NRC right now, my former agency, uh, to conduct those review activities. Next is the X Energy XE100. Uh, this is a high temperature gas, what is called a pebble bed reactor. It's called a pebble bed because it utilizes triso coated fuel particles about the size of a cue ball, uh, about 300,000 of those inside the vessel. Uh, and that is, those are, are used to produce the power and, and gas is moved through that. Uh, those modules are 80 megawatts electric. Uh, X Energy is one of two designs uh, that have been selected for the advanced reactor demonstration program of DOE. Uh, initial first year grant of $80 million and significant additional funding for that uh, and another reactor in the uh, infrastructure bill that's, that's working its way through. Uh, it is also the second of three designs which was selected by Ontario Power Generation uh, for deployment potentially at the Darlington site. Um, finally, uh, terrestrial energy with their integrated molten salt reactor. Uh, that's a 195 megawatt reactor design uh, that is uh, one of the uh, uh, pilots for the U.S. Nuclear Regulatory Commission and the Canadian Nuclear Safety Commission to harmonize their programs. I'll talk a little bit more about that in a later slide. Uh, and they are the third of the three designs selected um, by Ontario Power Generation. Uh, next is TerraPower with a natrium reactor. Uh, this is a uh, sodium fast reactor with, with a molten salt storage system. That's actually a, a joint project, Terrestrial and, and G. Hitachi. Uh, that nominally has 345 megawatts, um, but is paired with a molten salt storage facility that can allow it to operate at 500 megawatts for about five and a half hours. And that is the second of, of two designs uh, selected for the ARDP, uh, and currently TerraPower is working with Pacific Core uh, to select a site in Wyoming for deployment of that design. Uh, Oak Lose Aurora, this is a microreactor of 1.5 megawatts. Uh, they have filed an application with the NRC uh, back in March of 2020 and are currently working through that process. Uh, Kairos Power, which has a, an office based in Charlotte, is a pebble bed reactor with molten salt coolant, 145 megawatts electric, uh, and they received a $30 million risk reduction award from DOE uh, recently. Uh, finally, uh, the Westinghouse Evinci, Evinci system, which is a solid core heat pipe, uh, that ranges from 200 kilowatts to 5 megawatts. Uh, they were another selectee in the risk reduction award. So significant uh, awards by DOE allowing these reactor designs to continue to move forward. Next slide. 
Uh, in terms of the licensing process, this will seem familiar to some of you. Uh, the early stages of the process uh, were conducted under Part 50, which was a two-step process. First, you receive a construction license from the NRC, you build the plant, and then you go in for a subsequent operating license. Uh, this had been used extensively for the current fleet of nuclear units in the U.S. Um, there were some challenges with that with the administrative hearings uh, in the late 80s and 90s. And as a result of that, it was a call to simplify the process. Uh, that led to the creation of Part 52. Um, that is a one-step license where both a uh, construction and operating license are granted. Uh, it does require prior certification of the design before that can occur. Uh, uh, and, it, and, and that is currently what is being utilized for the construction of Southern companies, both of three and four units in Georgia. Uh, finally, on this slide, there is an effort underway uh, authorized by Congress to create a new Part 53. This would be focused on advanced reactor uh, technologies. Uh, that is currently the subject of, of negotiations and, and discussions uh, between the NRC staff or development and various industry and other uh, stakeholders. It's expected uh, that that would be uh, put in front of the commission for approval by 2024. Next slide. Next slide. Uh, when I have these discussions, I always like to make people aware that Canada is a major player in nuclear in the North American market. Uh, Ontario, which is the largest province in Canada, uh, derives all, all of its power carbon-free from either nuclear power or, hydro, or, or hydropower. Um, they seek to continue on that record and a variety of Canadian utilities are closely evaluating technologies today. Uh, New Brunswick Power, which is in the eastern part of Canada, uh, has selected two technologies. One is Moltex, which is a molten salt reactor, and the other one is advanced reactor concepts of, of an advanced reactor for deployment at an existing nuclear unit called Point Le Pro, uh, which is outside of New Brunswick. Uh, Ontario Power Generation, as I mentioned, has three different designs uh, which they are evaluating. Uh, they are also closely coordinating with a variety of U.S. utilities, which are closely monitoring that project. There are also three other utilities, one of them Bruce Power, which does operate nuclear units today, uh, and the other two, Sask Power, which is in um, uh, Saskatchewan and Alberta Power, are also collaborating with OPG and are planning to deploy uh, nuclear reactors for the first time. Uh, the Canadian, uh, I should say, nuclear laboratory uh, is serving as a site for the ultra-safe uh, micro-reactor that's under 10 megawatts. And finally, the Canadian Nuclear Safety Commission currently has 10 reactor designs under review. I mentioned earlier that I chair the Nuclear Industry Council Advanced Nuclear Working Group. Uh, we did a recent survey of our reactor developers, uh, 27 of them, and we identified that 65% of those designs will be deployed both in the United States and in Canada. So there's some very important reasons for cross-border collaboration. And for my part, I spent a lot of time working with, with my partners and friends uh, in Canada. Next slide. Um, I mentioned here the United States Nuclear Regulatory Commission and Canadian Nuclear Safety Commission, both of which are um, very well established and regarded regulators had an agreement dating back uh, almost two years ago at this point, or, or should be, I should say two years ago at this point, uh, to coordinate on the review of these designs. Um, for those of you who may not know, Canada uh, early on in its nuclear program were in a different way. Um, rather than light water reactors, which we developed here in the United States, the Canadians developed heavy water reactors, uh, which, which used deuterium uh, as, their, as their coolant and those utilize uh, natural uranium, unenriched uranium, uh, for their power production. It's been very successful for the Canadians uh, and is a backbone, certainly, of power generation in Ontario. But for the purposes of advanced reactor technologies, the designs that are being evaluated in the United States and those being evaluated in Canada are virtually the same. Hence, the notion of the two regulators moving more closely together in their approaches. Next slide. Next slide, please. Thank you. Um, this just goes into a little bit more detail. I'm not going to go into all of the uh, elements of this, but it was clearly an effort to focus on many of the technical issues uh, and avoid duplication in the reviews that are being undertaken uh, by the two regulators. This is an early step 
Uh, in fact, uh, X Energy uh, was also reviewed under this program and had an early uh, approval of, of a design activity it was working on. And so we certainly look forward to a lot of progress in this area uh, to assist many uh, different uh, technology developers. Next slide. Uh, there are uh, around the world a variety of other uh, developments in advanced nuclear technologies. The, the Brits, for their part, uh, are deploying a um, 440 megawatt pressurized water reactor uh, and have been working with Rolls-Royce on, on one of their designs. Uh, they have also signaled their desire to deploy high temperature gas uh, technologies as well. So a lot of activity and I expect the USNRC and CNSC will work uh, very closely with their uh, UK counterpart. Um, some of you may have seen in the, in the news, the Russians have developed uh, the world's first commercial uh, small modular reactor uh, that has been deployed uh, on the Arctic Sea, uh, ad ad academic Lomosov, I'm not very good with Russian pronunciation, I apologize, uh, is that design. Uh, it is two 35 megawatt reactors uh, originally based on Russian icebreaker technology. Um, I would note the United States was actually the first one to have a floating barge mounted reactor uh, that was called the Sturgis and was deployed at the Panama Canal uh, for about a decade and a half back in the 1960s and 70s. In Poland, uh, there's several uh, activities underway. Uh, one of them uh, is an attempt to potentially construct a GE BWRX 300 uh, for deployment. This is by Synthos Green Energy. Uh, there's also uh, activities underway with Ultrasafe uh, for a high temperature gas micro reactor. Uh, finally, uh, China has been making significant progress in the deployment of its own high temperature gas uh, pebble bed reactors. Uh, they have been loading fuel into those and are undergoing testing at, the, at, at this point uh, with those reactors expected to go online uh, either late this year or early next year, uh, depending on how that, how that plays out. Next slide. Um, what are some of the reasons why these are being developed? Well, there's some technical um, benefits to them. They're smaller, easier to deploy and construct. Uh, they, the safety features incorporated with them, both their passive uh, safety features as well as the characteristics of the fuel uh, mean that the risks from them are lower. Uh, it is emissions-free generation, and unlike uh, the current fleet of reactors, these are being designed to have load-following capability. The slide you'll see on or the picture or diagram, I should say, you'll see on the right uh, is a duck curve that comes from the California ICE ISO. Uh, it demonstrates that there is a disconnect between the power production, and, and some of this uh, comes from a large uh, solar deployment in California, with a very steep demand curve that begins uh, around five o'clock at night running through about nine o'clock at night. At home, they turn on their air conditioners and power generation goes up. Um, many of the advanced reactor designs, and I think uh, uh, the TerraPower Natrium is a good example of this, are really looking to try to help shape that uh, curve and bring in that additional uh, reflexive power in, in that uh, time of day. Next slide. One of the issues that is raised quite frequently is the cost of nuclear power. I know it's, um, it's certainly a sensitive issue for many. Um, there is, I think, an important recognition that when one looks at the, at the cost of nuclear assets, you've got to look at it over a, a longer period of life. Uh, this now uh, I, I make by way of comparison. In the United States, uh, a 1,000 megawatt nuclear power plant can be licensed for operations up to 80 years. And so you have a, a resource that can be paid for over a very long period of time. In comparison, if you were deploying uh, renewables currently and needed to provide 24-7 operation, you would need backup power in order to be able to power that when the wind wasn't blowing and the sun wasn't shining. Additionally, those assets do have a limited uh, lifetime currently, 20 to 25 years. And so to compare that asset, you would have to have multiple sets of, of renewable kit to make it happen. Uh, additionally, down the line, there is uh, an effort, I think this is commonsensical, to try to move toward bulk storage to, to back that up to provide um, greater opportunities um, for, for meeting some of those um, demand curves. Um, right now, 
under current technology, um, bulk battery storage is going to have typically a life of, of eight to 10 years. So the point I'm making with this slide is when you're making comparisons about cost, you really need to look at it in a much longer period of time if you're really going to be, in my view, comparing apples to apples, oranges and oranges. And I think that's one of the areas that we've been looking at uh, as it relates to these reactors as well. Next slide. So what are the uh, commercial and regulatory benefits of these technologies? Well, first off, they are scalable. Um, rather than having one major unit, you can certainly have a series of smaller units uh, and build those as, as demand comes in. Uh, the target, and this is really nth of, nth of a year cost, are, are to really meet a uh, something under $3,500 per kW uh, for that deployment. Now, recognizing that may be you know, 10 units down the line, that's certainly the target, and that is a, a reflection of uh, comparisons being made with natural gas. Um, hopefully, and this is obviously uh, to be determined, I think there's an expectation given the enhanced safety features of these designs, um, will they have uh, a regulatory and licensing structure that is adaptable to that? And that's, that's a work in progress. Um, there are unique resilience benefits to these reactors. Many of them are intended to be deployed underground. Uh, and many of them are um, being designed now with Black Star capabilities, uh, such that if there is a blackout, they would be able to bring those back online. Greater flexibility uh, also allows for the repowering of existing fossil fuel sites, and I think that's something many states are looking at. Certainly, you mentioned Wyoming, uh, but it's not just about electricity; it's also about process heat. Uh, many of these reactor designs use much higher temperatures that can be used both for power production uh, as well as industrial ap applications. <clears throat> And in those areas that need it, water purification and desalinization. Next slide. Uh, I'm not going to go into the, all the details of this slide, but suffice to say there has been extraordinary bipartisan uh, congressional support for advanced nuclear uh, over the years. Um, I used by way of example in 2021, uh, nuclear funding uh, for the Office of Nuclear Energy was increased to $1.5 billion. Biden administration has increased that uh, in its budget submission to 1.86 billion, and the folks up in Congress seem to be piling even more on board. Uh, there's going to be significant a significant amount of money in the infrastructure bill for advanced nuclear, and uh, when you see some of the votes that are occurring up in Capitol Hill, um, 75 plus percent of the members of Congress are supportive of these efforts. So it's a it's a it's been a, a real sea change in support for nuclear over, over the course of the last several years. Next slide. Uh, again, I'm not going to go over all of these details, but this was the omnibus uh, uh, FY21 omnibus authorization, and there were a variety of demonstration technologies that were funded uh, in this process, uh, including the production of advanced fuels uh, as well as um, fusion energy research. Uh, one of the things, and this is really on the topic today. Um, I have been working as outside counsel for the Fusion Industry Association, and they are making some dramatic uh, pro uh, they are making some dramatic process uh, improvements in, in their technologies as well. Next slide. So, in sum, uh, there is very strong support for nuclear energy in Washington. Uh, this is driven in large measure by global carbon uh, reduction targets. Um, Secretary Granholm. Uh, President Biden all have made very um, supportive comments about those technologies uh, and principally because of the part that we can play in meeting our nation's commitment to reducing carbon. That's clearly, uh, carbon reduction is clearly a major uh, sales point in nuclear today. Uh, Canada and the US, I think, are, are placed, well placed uh, to have a significant amount of collaboration going forward. And these reactor developments are moving quite quickly. Uh, and certainly look forward to talking more about them uh, today in, in the seminar. And with that, uh, I'll, I'll bring it to a close. Uh, I'd like to turn uh, first to Weston. Uh, if you've got comments or thoughts about what this all means for South Carolina. Jeff, happy to, and, and thanks for having me here today. And, and thanks for having Brian as well. Yeah, a couple of thoughts. I think that the politically, I think that the appeal of what you're talking about, the uh, carbon benefits, you know, the, the green lobby in South Carolina and North Carolina is particularly strong considering how 
conservative the region is politically. So I would say that the carbon benefit of this is a great selling point for furthering uh, the effort for on the advanced nuclear. I think secondly, I would say the sort of uh, expertise that we've got in South Carolina that you know, we've got all the Savannah Riverside expertise, we've got all the companies that are headquartered around the Charlotte area that you know are in the nuclear industry. So I think that there is a certainly an economic development component of this that I think could be of great benefit to South Carolina and to North Carolina. Uh, and then thirdly, what's interesting is of the power currently generated in South Carolina, 40% of it is nuclear based, right? So that effectively is double the national average I think the national average is 19 or 20 percent. So system experience wise, there's also an advantage here in locating nuclear in the region just because from a sort of interconnection system experience, we've got knowledge and experience on this. So I think that there are a bunch of upsides here. Um, we can talk a bit later about the safety issues, but the upsides, I think, will outweigh the downsides. And so um, I, I'm, you know, in favor of what you're what is being proposed here but i'd like to hear brian's comments as well thanks weston um yeah if, if i would i'd like to or could i like to take a just a second for those of you who um, don't know who either lockhart power or i am just to give you an idea uh we're we're an investor in utility in south carolina we're one of three we're the only south carolina based investor in utility that, that's left we're also the most renewable utility in america uh, 100 percent of the generation that, that we have is renewable and um, last year we generated enough power from those renewable resources to supply about 95 percent of our retail load and that that's in south carolina so there's no you know there's no mandates for that so we're we're already where a lot of utilities are trying to get to in the next quarter century or so in terms of, of renewable energy profile obviously carbon free energy is a is a very high priority of ours um, and, and nuclear has, has been of interest, you know, literally since it's, since it's been commercialized. Um, we, we're not a nuclear operator. Uh, we are a nuclear customer, pretty much like everybody here on the call today, or the, the, the seminar today. Um, so we, we have a, a perspective that's a little different than a traditional investor in utility would. It's, it's, it's somewhat balanced. We see, we see the benefits of nuclear. We, we like nuclear as a, as a technology. We also see the, the risks. We see, some of, we see what's happened in South Carolina and you know, not so fond of, of some of those things. So um, I, I, I hope what I can bring uh, to, to this meeting is kind of a, uh, maybe an everyman type, type perspective. Um, nuclear is so unique. I, 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 I came up with a little phrase. I, it, it, won't, it won't catch on, but it's fine. It's, uh, it's, it's uniquely or um, there is no other carbon free base load generation source at scale. Um, and so it, it, you know, while there may be some that would say, you know, based on what's happened in the last you know, 10 or 20 years, you know, nuclear's time is, is over. Uh, we absolutely do not feel that way. We, we feel very strongly there's a, there's a place for it. And hopefully if any of you are in that camp coming into this, this session today, by the end, you'll see some of the same potential that, uh, that we see. Um, the high level concern that's outside of the scope today, but it, it, it's important to understand, I think, is nuclear is here right now. As Wesson said, it's 40% of the generation in South Carolina, which is, which is huge and it's great from an environmental footprint perspective. Um, but we're not building any more of it right now. There, there's a gap uh, between today and the advanced nuclear technology, as Jeff has outlined, which we hope we're sooner than later, but there's still a time gap there. And so, as, as we don't build new nuclear, we do have new load and we're shutting down fossil fuel plants, a uh, number of coal and, and, you know, and not really building much in the terms of new natural gas. What, you know, what's gonna, what's gonna take that place for that cost effective base load generation? Um, you know, renewables are coming, but they're not base load until battery technology is both proven and cost effective, they, there's a time gap. And so kind of high level, big picture, that, that's a that's a general concern of ours and probably a lot of people on on the call. Um, so that's yeah, I think that's a general perspective um, coming in. There, there's you know, there's there's more that we have in terms of you know the pros and cons. Um, Jess outlined those very well, so I'm not gonna I'm not gonna repeat them by any sense. Um, 
I, I think the you know, from my perspective, I'm an engineer by background. You know, to Georgia Tech, they had a great nuclear engineering, engineering program. So you know, I was groomed early on to be a, an advocate for it. But the idea that we can have shop fabricated plants, kind of you know, cookie cutter almost at, at some point down the road, um, is very appealing to avoid a, a Crystal River type failure. Um, this happened down in Florida. For those of you who are maybe familiar with, with that, um, with that issue that they've got. The only nuclear plant in the southeast that's, that's in the process of being decommissioned, the rest are all active, which is which is great. But the more we can standardize things, um, have them shop fabricated, inspected, as opposed to being built out in the out in the field, out in the real world, there's just a lot more opportunity for issues, not construction, but also during the uh, the, the various maintenance you know periods that um, the, the maintenance um, uh, efforts that have to occur on a regular basis. The more we can minimize those. Through technology, the better off we are. Uh, the the distributed generation benefits um, are, are very appealing to me. The uh, you know, having fewer eggs in one basket, you know, instead of a thousand megawatt unit, um, there's you know maybe five, fifty, a hundred, two hundred. But um, you know, so even if there is one you know catastrophe, it's not it's not as broadly impactful as as what we've seen here in South Carolina. Um, avoiding new transmission investment is 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 a huge benefit that's probably you know overlooked a little bit. Um, this, this looks like again if, if these are deployed well, they're you know they're they're distributed generation almost, but at larger scale and um, and with uh, you know with very high load factors. Um, so that that's a lot of money that wouldn't necessarily have to be spent if these are placed out in in different communities. Um, there's a, I think the local grid stability and reliability, um, there's, there's benefits there, lower system losses potentially. Uh, Jeff mentioned black start capabilities, which I think would be huge for, for, for individual communities where these might be located. On the economic development side, um, we've got uh, David Doctor and Lucas Brunn will be speaking at the end of this, I'm sure about that in detail, so I won't, I won't say anything other than say that they, they should be huge for South Carolina and the Carolinas in the region in general. Um, you know, between what we've got going on in the state of Aiken and, and all the industries that are relatively uh, local that Jeff already mentioned, um, you know, all of those, uh, you know, stand to benefit from, from federal and, and hopefully state um, economic uh, incentives. Um, having, having, you know, having a number of these scattered around counties also, I think, uh, democratizes the economic benefits. Uh, from a property tax perspective, for example, instead of having you know one or two or three counties in a given state that have a, a phenomenal benefit, you could have half the counties in the state um, that that are that are getting solid, you know, very significant benefits. Especially in rural counties, it can be a game changer. And and again, they don't, you know, if, if something ever happened to one of those, they wouldn't have all their eggs in one basket. It wouldn't be as devastating, for example, if it happened, um, you know, in, in a given county uh, today. The last thing is the environmental benefits, um, and, and uh, th there's the obvious ones, but I also wanted to, to look down the road if you compare the total life cycle of, 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 what, this, of what these technologies promise um, from construction all the way to decommissioning and, and spent nuclear fuel. And then you compare that to the number of, of batteries and all the different technologies, all the different metals, all the different things, substances, materials, elements that would have to be mined, processed, um, shipped, utilized at end of life, hopefully recycled, and some amount of that would end up in, in landfills or otherwise disposed of. I, I think that um, that this probably has a, a much better environmental footprint on a total lifestyle perspective. So um, that's a the, the last thing about having distributed um, having these distributed. There are a couple challenges. Um, there's so many more of these, so there's more opportunities for for failures, although on a smaller scale. Uh, the you know, radiation leak, for example, you know, hopefully these will be designed so that they won't be terrorist targets. But if they are, there's a lot more of those out there. And then putting them in communities, there's always going to be NIMBY type opposition. So there's going to be, you know, if you put it into more communities, there's going to be more of that opposition. So communities will have to decide, you know, for themselves whether this is something that they want to find a place for or not. So that that's a lot, um, but I, I, that's that's kind of a broad perspective we've got. Well, Brian and, and Winston, thank you very much for, for starting out there. I've got some questions, but we've had quite a few that have appeared in the, in the chat, and, and obviously I think we ought to try to get to some of those. Um, the first one we have is, is there a potential for the new technologies to be deployed uh, as ha ad hoc dedicated energy for very large uh, mobility users, um, including rail or international uh, hydrogen ammonia ship fuel? 
Um, I didn't touch on that in, in my presentation. The answer to that is, is yes. Um, I did include in the chat function a recent paper that uh, two E4 members um, put together. It's Clean Air Task Force, uh, assisted by Pillsbury, uh, that talked about the use of uh, nuclear generated hydrogen uh, and ammonia, which can be used for the decarbonization of large uh, long range maritime fleets. Uh, there's also possibility for, for the use of hydrogen uh, in the in uh, in short range near shore uh, hydrogen uh, direct hydrogen uh, utilizing facilities and there's a lot of work underway uh, here in the Carolinas uh, on the use of hydrogen uh, to deal with with, uh, with rail issues so yeah that's that's certainly something which which can uh, which can make sense let, let me um, let me um, turn to the, the two of you um, you know, one of the areas that the Biden administration has discussed is, is the possibility of deploying advanced reactors to repower uh, former coal sites. Um, just want to get your thoughts on this as an opportunity. And is that something uh, that could potentially happen in South Carolina as we now see it's happening in Wyoming? Yeah, I guess, Jeff, my thought, I love that idea from certainly from a land use point of view. These are sites that are, or, you know, effectively what it is is a brownfield site being reused for another purpose. You know, the transmission is already there. Uh, you, you're not taking up more real estate to locate one of these things. I think I think that's a great idea and should be sort of at the top of the list as to what we do with these shuttered coal stuffs. So I think it, you know it's a win from an environmental point of view. It's a win from a transmission point of view, a land use point of view. You know, I think the question there really is going to be, you know, locating that in a setting that is appropriate appropriate for a nuclear facility. Some coal fired sites, you know, are in locations where you wouldn't want to put a nuclear facility for hurricane reasons or that sort of thing. So, but I think that working around those issues, I think it, it's a, a capital idea. I'll, I'll, yeah, I'll, 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 I'll comment. Thanks, Watson. Yeah, I completely agree. And anytime you can reuse. Uh, transmission infrastructure, for example, um, you know, from from very large coal plants, that that's an obvious win for everybody. You also have typically uh, an environmentally impaired site, to, at least to some extent, and so being able to you know put off the reclamation of that is is a good thing. I you know we we've actually built a a solar a good size solar project on environmentally impaired land um, in, in Union County in South Carolina. So any kind of reuse of existing, you know, uh, reuse in, of, of environmentally impaired land, I, I think is a is a great thing for everybody. I, I would actually say that there's going to be so much, typically there's so much infrastructure on the transmission side associated with coal, coal plants. I would actually, you know, hope there's an effort to reserve those for the larger and the, the larger scale nuclear plants, um, the, the new advanced nuclear plants, as opposed to the ones that are smaller and mid-scale, because there's only so many of, the, of those coal plants. And if you look at the infrastructure as a true asset, which it is, the infrastructure itself, you wouldn't want to waste that on a, on a small plant unless there's going to be a, you know, a number of the smaller ones. Well, I think that's a, I, I think that's a really good point. And, and one thing I, I didn't mention in my presentation, you know, the designs that are underway right now uh, there's some changes being undertaken at the Nuclear Regulatory Commission. Typically, the nuclear power plants that we have here in the United States today have a 10-mile emergency evacuation zone because that type of planning was necessary given the technologies, the light water reactors that were being deployed in making sure that the risks uh, were appropriately managed for the people living around those sites. The, the NRC more recently has, has uh, recognized that these advanced reactor technologies don't need such a large emergency planning zone. The, the source term, the amount of material they have, the way in which they're designed could result in a significantly reduced emergency planning zone, frankly, because those risks are, are, are much uh, different and smaller. And so one of the considerations right now is whether you could actually have for some of these designs a fence line emergency planning zone, because that's really what you need to worry about from the standpoint uh, of radiation exposure in the event of an accident. That that certainly changes the dynamic of where you might be able to utilize these plants and the risks that are attended to. So it's a lot of, a lot of interesting a aspects to these designs um, going yeah, forward. Yeah, just one, one comment on that, sort of, the, you know, my practice is largely renewables. So this is interesting to me to be tuning into this. But the, on the safety question, it is probably worth you taking a second and just giving a little more 
you know, there are going to be some green opponents of nuclear power who are going to say this, you know, the Fukushima, you know, looking back only 10 years ago, what, what has changed since then? And I think you partially answered that in the thing you just said, but I thought I'd give you another chance to sort of elaborate. What, what has changed since Fukushima? Well, uh, that's a, that's a great question. I think, I think there's a couple of things that that particular question. You know, we could, we could, uh, unlimber that for, for the whole session today. Um, I, I have a personal view having studied Fukushima very, very closely. I think what we had at Fukushima wasn't, wasn't a failure of technology. It was a failure of, of people and, and, the, and, uh, the activities that were undertaken, uh, in response, but we'll, we'll lay that one aside for a. For a much larger discussion, perhaps another day. These reactor technologies um, incorporate a variety of aspects, uh, and it, it is dependent on the on the technology itself. Uh, high temperature gas reactors, for example, the use of triso fuel. These are specially coated particles and are designed in such a way that much of the containment of the radiation that you would normally have large containment. Um, or large uh, light water pressurized wa uh, water reactors. And the containment is actually in the fuel itself. It's designed in such a way that you can't have uh, that re release of radiation that you would have uh, in, in a large light water plant. In, in a molten salt reactor, uh, for example, they operate at atmospheric pressure. There's no way for a large um, uh, ejection of that material because it's not pressurized. It's, you don't really have the opportunity to, to significantly spread it. Um, many, many safety features are, are incorporated in these designs that are more modernized from their co counterparts in the light water reactor industry. Some of them will be underground. We'll hear several of those um, being discussed today. So you, you don't have uh, the potential to have that direct release. So there, there are a, a variety of different factors that result in the assessment. And I think this is where ultimately the nuclear regulatory commission will come to uh, that these, that these reactors can be deployed. Are safer and and certainly don't need the same level of, of emergency uh, evacuation zones as their as their predecessors. That's let me super. let me uh, let let me um, go back to uh, to our questions on the on the chat. Um, small modular reactors with electrolyzer plants, and that's for making of hydrogen production, uh, can load follow by instantaneously switching between grid electricity generation. And hydrogen manufacturing is this something that could uh, assist in addressing the California duck curve in, in other locations? Um, and the answer is yes, uh, it certainly could. There's a variety of grants underway right now um, by the Department of Energy to uh, about four or five U.S. nuclear power plants where they will be producing hydrogen, even either for that load following capability or using that green hydrogen for other. Uh, other potential uses uh, in, in a carbon free way. So I think we're going to see a lot more uh, in that regard relative to uh, hydrogen and, and nuclear coming together. And Jeff, in, in, in not only in that you know, somewhat specific circumstance, but in general, if, if you have the ability to put a, a, a modular nuclear plant pretty much wherever you want, and you have the ability with electrolysis to put uh, that plant wherever you want, um, you could also, and, and assuming that new, that the, the new nuclear becomes, you know, relatively cost effective in terms of, you know, the high load factor and cost per kilowatt hour, you, you could have that be a standalone installation, you know, in any number of places and create hydrogen, you know, cost effectively, potentially. The challenge with hydrogen, you know, is that it, it's relatively expensive to build a plant. And so, if you build a plant and then only use it at you know some of the time, it makes it that much more challenging from a cost perspective. Whereas, you, if you paired it with a base load generation, it makes you know you get a lot more out of investment. No, I think that's a, I think that's a really good point, and and I think I, I think uh, the decoupling of location with energy production is is an important aspect. And I, I you know frankly, it's one I don't think people are looked at as closely. So I think you make a really good really good point there. Um, let me ask both of you. Obviously, part of Part of the issue is, is really looking at economic development. How, how can these technologies really be an, an enhancement to job creation and helping the people in, in this region? Um, South Carolina has been a, a very significant employer in the nuclear supply chain. We've got a lot of those folks who are represented here at the conference. What, what 
potential economic opportunities do you all see uh, for the state in being part of the international supply chain for these technologies? Weston, I guess I'll, I'll start with you on that one. Sure. I mean, look, if we've got the expertise that I referenced earlier, both at the Savannah River site and in the larger Charlotte area, and we, as a policy matter, encourage the development of uh, nuclear not only locally, but as a, in a national sense. I mean, the companies and the professionals who are local who have expertise in this can be, you know, effectively, Jeff, just like you, you've got a, basically a worldwide nuclear legal practice. And I, we could, if we facilitate at a local level and encourage nuclear at a local level, it will only prop up and encourage the professionals who are located in the Carolinas who are involved in, in nuclear fields and it'll let, allow those folks to take that local experience and have kind of a national or international footprint to do this kind of work. So I think from a, you know, strictly from a professional services, which is the side of this that I can at this from, I can see the advantages on that. Uh, but I'll pause there and let uh, Brian add a comment. Yeah, I agree with all that. Uh, I think the economic development piece is probably, the, to me, the most exciting uh, element of this because it's it's tremendous. There's there's so much money um, at a at a federal level, at least, that's being you know applied towards this. You know, I, I think it, it's almost like a you know it's almost like a reboot of, of fifty or sixty years ago, where this country you know led the world in development of this technology, and then we. You know, for for a few decades, kind of you know, let let it ride, and and saw other countries you know take a leadership position. I, I see this as an opportunity to reestablish that leadership position. Um, I see the Carolinas and the Southeast U.S. in general as having the option if if entities like us step up and 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 have the same vision um, for the role we can play not only in this country but worldwide. I see there as being you know all, all types of opportunities. I already mentioned you know where where the technology is deployed. Uh, the, you know, how that could be a much more distributed and, and democratic, um, you know, dissemination of the, of the economic benefits. Um, but I, I, I see on the de economic development side, again, we'll talk about this later on. I see it as being huge. And, and when SCIBA was absorbed by E4, one of, you know, one of the, the main principles of SCIBA was let's find the nexus of clean energy and economics. That, that was, you know, in a, in an overriding, overarching principle. And so this is the nexus of clean technology and economics. It's one reason it's so exciting. There, that's a broad picture. One very specific, um, you know, application. And I think the, the, the idea of electrolysis cu coupling with this is great. Um, another one, uh, you know, anything that is, is potentially very beneficial, uh, you know, big data uh, is, is an area that has unbelievable um, electrical you know, usage growth, even as, as processors become more, um, more efficient. Being able to take a new, uh, a new load center that wants to run, you know, at, at close to 100% load factors and coupling it with a energy source that wants to run at near 100% um, production or capacity factors is ideal. You know, take, taking, you know, a 20 or 30% you know, uh, solar and or wind source and coupling it, then you have to have batteries and it's just much more complex and much more expensive. And so that that there's some promise there. I think in the Silicon Valley side of things, you know, they'll have to get comfortable with the environmental you know, footprint associated with uh, advanced nuclear compared to, you know, some other sources. Yeah, well, I'll, just, I'll add one quick, quick note just on the, there's an analog here, the renewable developers in North Carolina who sort of built this mighty engine in North Carolina and, and did a kind of an incredible job there. And those same people are now kind of rolling that across the South and across the country. They're doing, those developers are doing work in Oregon and all over the country, California. So there's an analog here that you've got some professional expertise locally that has sort of extended itself into a national footprint. And I think that there's an opportunity, opportunity here on the nuclear side as well. Well, I think those are, I think those are all great points. And I, and I would note, you know, when we first founded E4, uh, it was after a McKenzie study that showed there was an extraordinary number of folks in this region in the energy industry and, and in particular the nuclear industry. Uh, and I think I think that that kind of growth and background certainly is, is going to um, bode well for for this region going forward. Let me just very quickly before we close out, there is one uh, question I did want to address in the chat. Um, do you know of any research opportunities for undergraduate students on nuclear reactors? A fellow chemical engineering student 
interested in nuclear energy. Um, great to hear that. Um, we didn't talk about um, we didn't talk about education in our presentation, um, but we are fortunate to have a number uh, of universities in in the region: uh, University of South Carolina, NC State, uh, UNC Charlotte, and others uh, that are involved in the development and deployment of advanced reactors. And so there are a myriad of opportunities here uh, in the state, and certainly we're encouraging if you would like to enter nuclear as a career, um, there's certainly great opportunities here to do so. Um, with that, I, I, I would note um, great final series of, of discussions about the economic importance of nuclear. Um, I think uh, Lucas Braun and David Docter will be following up on that toward the end. Uh, certainly stay tuned uh, for that. There are some tremendous opportunities uh, coming forward and available for the Carolinas that you really ought to become aware of. Um, with that, I, I would like to thank both Weston and Brian for this great kickoff conversation. Uh, and with that, I want to turn to our next panel uh, to, to really carry the, the, the discussion forward with specific uh, opportunities for the deployment of advanced nuclear. Um, with this, uh, Dom Claudio, who's a senior executive uh, director of sales for New Scale Power, Simon Irish, who is the chief executive officer of Terrestrial Energy, uh, and who has recently located his operations, uh, his headquarters in Charlotte. Uh, John Ball, from Women's North Carolina, who's executive vice president of G. Hitachi Nuclear Energy. Uh, and Jeff Harper, uh, vice president of strategy and business development for X Energy, uh, which is a Rockville based, Rockville, Maryland based uh, developer of high temperature gas reactors. Uh, gentlemen, if you could turn on your cameras and join us, we're ready to uh, kick off at this point. Dom, are you with us? I am. I am. Can you hear me now? Great. Can hear you now. Great. With that, I'll I'll turn it to you. Thank you. Okay. Great. Thank you, Jeff, and uh, thank you again for the opportunity to speak today. Uh, okay. I know Jessica's on the line. Perhaps uh, she she can help Don there. I think we've got Don has some technical difficulties. If he could, um, we'll we'll set him aside for a moment. Simon Irish, are you? available or I guess we've got Jeff yes um uh I think I can you hear me uh, thank thank you Jeff well well firstly thank you very much to EC Caroline's for the opportunity to participate uh, in this uh in in this uh very interesting discussion today along along with my um colleagues from the advanced reactor industry so if you could uh, perhaps turn to the next slide Uh, one more, please. So a little bit of background about Terrestrial Energy. We're a private company. We're in the technology space, the advanced reactor space, um, and our purpose, a very important statement for any technology company involved in innovation, our purpose is to commercialize a cost competitive nuclear power plant in a compelling time frame using a targeted and pragmatic set of nuclear technology and design choices. There are many choices um, when choosing technologies and choosing particular design approaches for a nuclear power plant. It, it's not a monochromatic technology. It is a rich tapestry of many technologies. As a company, we're using molten salt reactor technology. That's called Generation 4. Generation 4 was designated in 2000 uh, and 2001 by an international body as the type of innovations that are likely to see nuclear being able to deliver a better product, a better nuclear power plant in terms of cost, safety, waste, etc. So we're using one such technology, a molten salt reactor technology. They, they are, if you looked at um, the Generation 4 category of nuclear technologies, it is a rich tapestry, but they share one thing in common. They're very different in many other, in virtually every other regards, but they share one thing in common, they operate hot. And high temperature, high quality heat generation is is going to be essential for delivering that better nuclear product. Our, our nuclear power plant design uh, is called the Integral Molten Salt Reactor. We're, advanced, uh, we're advancing engineering, and as we advance through engineering, we're able to engage uh, uh, with regulators at an early stage, and that is essential uh, on your path to market, early regulatory engagement. You're able to do that if you are advancing in a disciplined uh, way through engineering. So that's that's the that's the point we are with our engineering 
and our regulatory engagement. Uh, utility engagement is critically important too. We are looking to sell what we believe to be a better product uh, to the uh, utility sector in North America. Uh, we, along with a number of my colleagues on the panel today, are engaged with Ontario Power Generation. We're one of three SMR candidates that have been considered for deployment at Darlington. And the time frame is very meaningful here. The time frame is a first commercial plant at Darlington by 2028. And if you are to pursue that, you have to make your technology choice now, and you have to proceed with license ap applications in 2022. Ontario Power Generation in North America has one of the, I would say, perhaps the leading utility project in terms of its commitment, not just the top of the house, but this project is supported at a, at a government level too, but its commitment to deploy one of these advanced reactors at his Starlington site by 2020, uh, by 2028 in terms of uh, um, uh, commissioning dates. Um, and we're doing this, um, we are innovating, developing our integral molten salt reactor power plant. We're not doing it in isolation of market circumstances. We're doing it at a time when there's increasing policy support, not just at a national level, but also at a state level as well. There's increasing utility interest, and Jeff, Jeff Merrifield touched on this in one of his slides, in terms of the commitments the utility sector are making as they looked to deliver on their commitments, long-term commitments for clean power generation by, 20, uh, by, by 2050, and also recognise you can't get entirely there without nuclear. That last piece requires clean, reliable, base load power generation. And what's also interesting as well, there's an increasing amount of investment support. And these trends reinforce each other, but it's this it's in this context that we as a private company are, are, are taking out the baton and innovating to deliver a, a very different nuclear power plant. Um, next slide, please. So I mentioned regulatory engagement. You have to engage with the regulator early. That's essential if you if you are to have a clear path to market. Uh, we're engaged with um, the Canadian Nuclear Safety Commission. Uh, in, 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 in Canada that's supporting the activities that are um, essential for OPG's decision. Uh, we, we commenced the vendor design review in Canada uh, in, uh, in, in 2017. We anticipate finishing that uh, early, uh, early, early next year. Uh, we're also engaged with the US uh, NRC um, with a licensing strategy that um, uh, is, uh, is uh, is uh, drawn from the existing regulatory protocol protocols established by the NR, uh, by the uh, the NRC. We're using a Part 52 standard design approval of the IMSR core unit, which is the which is the different piece. This is the uh, this is the uh, non light water reactor piece of our power plant, and because it's uh, uh, it's different from a, a light water reactor, uh, it's our view that this should be the subject of the focus subject of a, a standard design approval. Um, that, uh, that standard design of approval will be a prerequisite uh, for further applications to the NRC as we move forward with the utility uh, and, uh, and for the process of construction and operation of first plant in, in, the, uh, in the United States. Um, the, the technology is also subject to uh, joint review by the US NRC uh, and the Canadian Nuclear Safety Commission as part of the 2018 Memorandum of Cooperation established between those two agencies. So um, if I could, if you could turn to the next slide, please. This just speaks to the trend line, the market context, the policy context in which we're operating. And the message here is, is a simple one. Uh, and that is there is there's a trend line in terms of policy development in the United States, in Canada, even Japan, and that those those policy developments provide increasing level of confidence for private companies and for private capital to support this type of innovation. Next slide, please. So perhaps a picture and it speaks many words. Uh, this is an image of, uh, of Darlington um, uh, and in the very center uh, of that image is our power plant design, um, and we're able to uh, to generate that. It, it reflects where we are with the the engineering of our power plant. This is this is a CAD file that's been passed to an architect uh, architect engineering firm. But the the point here is that this is a small modular reactor on an existing site, and there's a feature here that you see in many other sites uh, across North America, uh, and that is 
uh, those sites are capable of supporting in uh, the, the uh, construction of many small modular reactor power plants. So the possibility here is you start with one, you, you uh, uh, and have a limited amount of capital, you incorporate your lessons learned and you move on to the next one. And through a series of projects over perhaps uh, you know, 20, you know, 20, 25 years, you build out your site such that it, it has a significant amount of clean power generation. And that's, that's, that's potentially an attractive model for us and an attractive development model, deployment model for the utilities that we're working with. Uh, next slide, please. So I want to just touch on the technology. Um, and uh, next slide, please. So I mentioned at the very beginning that we use uh, that um, uh, that uh, our principal objective is a cost competitive power plant. There are five factors uh, that go into defining um, that the, the, the relating the cost competitive position of your power plant with your technology and design and design choices. And those five factors are size, construction method, temperature, pressure, and inherent safety. Size, we have to make them more right size from financing perspective, project management perspective, uh, and uh, the, 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 um, uh, the utility preferences are for, uh, for smaller plant. But in making them smaller, you, you're going to make nuclear power more expensive. Fixed costs abound wherever you look uh, in, the nuclear, in, in the nuclear industry. So we'll, we'll, uh, we'll, we'll offset some of those with construction method. And this is a, this is a, a very, this is going to be extremely important for large scale production. Uh, 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 many of the vendors of advanced SMRs are incorporating modularity into their design. Uh, that's a marriage between the, the designer, the vendor, and the supply chain that also has to commit and invest in incorporating uh, modular construction methods uh, into their, uh, their supply of components to build these power plants quickly on site. Speed of production is going to be, speed of construction is going to be important. Uh, the with uh, modular construction methods, we anticipate we can build one of these plants in five years. That's going to be that's important. Uh, a uh, um, financing a nuclear power plant today is is challenging, even though interest rates are possibly at multi-century lows. If interest rates back up, constructing a nuclear power plant quickly is going to be utterly essential to make the economics work. Uh, the other three factors are associated with the technology itself. Temperature, pressure, and inherent safety. Generation four systems operate hot. Creating high quality heat enables you to have a much more efficient machine. A nuclear power plant is just a machine. Converting thermal energy, which is expensive, given the nature of the technology, it's capital intensive, to turning a turbine turning a generator and, and, and selling electric power. So you have the opportunity for generation four systems to be a much more efficient, a much more efficient linkage between the capital piece and the, the, uh, and, and electric power production, and hence reduce the, pr the price, the cost of that electric power production. Um, next slide, please. Now, the reason we're able to, our, our technology and design choices are able to deliver a much more competitive nuclear power plant is associated with our fundamental technology choice, and that is the use of molten salt. Um, nuclear safety is all about cooling, cooling in all operating scenarios, cooling your nuclear reactor in all every conceivable set of action scenarios too. And we believe using a molten salt, uh, we have a, uh, we're able to deliver uh, a coolant which is superior to using water as a coolant. And that superior, superiority is defined by thermal stability. We don't need to maintain our salt at very high, high pressures to operate at high temperature. It's thermally very stable up to extremely high temperature. It has high neutron stability and high Pacific heat capacity. Salts are excellent heat transfer, fluid, heat transfer fluids. And transferring heat out of your reactor for operation and creating power is very important for um, your safety case. Uh, and also your commercial case too, but it's also important for safety as well. So next slide, please. In terms of commercial readiness, we're working with, with OPG and others for near-term deployment of our, uh, of our power plant design. And that near-term deployment is, 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 is going to be defined by the genealogy 
of your technology and design choices. Um, our technology is, is, is drawn from the work that's been undertaken um, over many decades, largely at Oak Ridge National Lab um, in, uh, 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 in, uh, in Tennessee. And um, uh, the, our design incorporates many of those, many of those practices, those best practices uh, into, the, uh, uh, into our power plant design. So next, next slide, please. So in terms of how the power plant works, uh, this is a schematic of our of our power, of our uh, of our uh, uh, power plant. The essential features is the replaceable reactor core, this gold like can, which is the reactor core that operates for a seven year period in an operating silo. After seven years, it's replaced with a new core. So you effectively, with this replacement cycle of a major component, you have a a a power plant, a nuclear power plant. That is not constrained by the life, the the the, um, the lifetime of any major component. So, you know, we're looking to extend existing nuclear power plants for 40 to 60 to 80 years. That's very important. Uh, but with with our design, you could potentially have have a very long term operating life um, for that um, for that nuclear facility at that particular site. Next slide, please. Uh, another schematic which uh, connects the, uh, uh, the the reactor with commercial use. On the left-hand side, you have the molten salt. Molten salts are excellent heat transfer fluids. We have three loops of molten salts that are transferring heat out to commercial activity. One commercial activity is power generation because you're providing high quality heat. You can do that much more efficiently than conventional technologies. You can do that to support through thermal storage to provide grid services and deal with the duck curve effect that we've uh, mentioned earlier in this, uh, uh, in, this, in this conference. But you can also do something for the first time, that, uh, uh, and, and that is support industrial heat processes. Nuclear has not been able to do that because conventional nuclear creates low quality heat that doesn't have an application in the industrial sector where large thermal loads are required for chemical synthesis, particularly chemical synthesis and petrochemical production. So, um, you know, this opens the opportunity of providing heat and power to support very efficient, clean methods of hydrogen production, ammonia production, and synthetic fuels for shipping transportation and avi aviation transportation. Um, next slide, please. Sam, I think we need to uh, yes, wrap, up. wrap it up. Okay, so um, you know, Jeff, I think the uh, um, I, I will leave it there. Um, maybe a couple of final points, actually, uh, since we move to that next slide. So my final point is price will drive deployment. Uh, 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 we believe that our set of technology and design choices leads to a cost competitive nuclear power plant that's cost competitive against alternatives. Um, and that is going to be important for market deployment. Next slide, please. Price is not the only thing required for market deployment. Life cycle uh, um, CO2 emissions is going, to, uh, is going to be critically important too. Uh, we, along with all the other technologies in the nuclear space, have superb, on a relative basis, superb lifetime emissions um, levels. So that's uh, that, that that's that's going to be important to deployment. Next slide, please. Yeah, Simon, we really got to. We, okay, we, I will leave it there. So. Thank you, Jeff. All right, thank you, thank you so much. Now, hopefully, uh, Dom is back. Can you hear us, Dom? I can hear you. Can you hear me? And can you hear yes, you? Can Great. You hear now, so we we'll right. off camera, but we'll get back to your presentation. You can pick it up where you left off. That'd be great. Thank you so much. I appreciate you coming back. Uh, just so I am flying blind for some reason. I lost my signal at the top of the hour, but I do have a copy of the presentation and we'll just coordinate that way. So, uh, uh, just a word great. about the it's agenda. Showing, yeah, showing the cover slide. The blue slide. Yeah. Okay, great. Uh, the cover yep. slide. Yep. So we'll talk a little bit about who, who new scale is a little bit about our technology. Um, a little bit about where we are in commercialization space and licensing space. And a little bit about our first project. So that's pretty much the agenda uh, for the next 10 minutes, 10, 12 minutes or so. So.
So uh, next slide where it says New Scales Mission. So in a word, what we're trying to accomplish is to develop a scalable advanced nuclear technology for the production of electricity, heat, hydrogen, and clean water on a global basis. And we're intending to do that by providing a technology that's smarter, cleaner, safer, and cost competitive. And I'll talk about each of those in a minute. Uh, next slide, please. So who is NewScale? So uh, NewScale was formed in 2007 for the purpose of designing and commercializing a small modular reactor known as the NewScale Power Module. And I will add in, in here as a side note that NewScale is not an equipment manufacturer. And to the extent that this organization is interested in understanding supply chain implications, uh, please know that to the extent that uh, we are very reliant on local supply chain and to the extent that this would have a positive impact economically on the fabrication and the deployment of a new scale uh, uh, SMR, uh, again, relying on the local supply chain is key. So going back a little bit to the technology and the evolution of the technology, uh, the initial concept was developed as part of a, a 2000, year 2000 US DOE program known as the Multi-Application Small Light Water Reactor Program. And uh, I, I would add that uh, th this, this uh, uh, testing program was built around um, uh, passive uh, natural circulation as, na as, as a passive safety system. And it was, was part of the AP600 and AP1000 design. And I mentioned that to say that uh, this technology is, is evolutionary in nature to a great extent, but to the extent that that has meaning when dealing with the regulator and minimizing the departures from what already exists from a data standpoint, that's a, that's a key element when we talk about de-risking de activities and licensing space. Um, next key milestone was 2011, and that's when Floor became our lead investor. And there were two noteworthy uh, uh, consequences of that. One, obviously, having a, an investor such as Floor to help fund and advance the technology and demonstrate the technology to the NRC was, was key. The other aspect, which uh, will pay benefits during construction space, is that Floor, being a world-class uh, engineer procurement and construction company, was has been involved since the beginning in evaluating our design for constructability. So as we prepare the detailed design, as we prepare to go into the field, we know that we've had pretty much a decade of work behind us already in evaluating certain aspects of the components and subcomponents uh, from the standpoint of a, const a constructability standpoint. Uh, the next noteworthy date, 2013, New Scale won a competitive DOE uh, matching fund award. At that time, it was $325 million. To date, we've benefited from over $400 million in DOE funding as far as advancing the technology. To date, we have over 560 patents in nearly 20 countries approximately 450 employees and five offices in the United States, including Charlotte, North Carolina. And again, the, one of the more important uh, milestones was in August 2020, where the U.S. Nuclear Regulatory Commission approved New Scale's design. And so we certified our design at that time. And that, that, that level of effort was very significant. We'll talk a little bit more about that in, in a moment. Total investment today, the New Scale is approaching $1.2 billion. Um, next slide, please. So we talk about smarter, cleaner, safer, and cost competitive. What do we mean by that? It's smarter from the standpoint that the design can support a number of applications, can integrate well with renewables, wind and solar, can provide highly reliable uh, power to mission critical facilities, such as data centers, hospitals, and military bases, and can serve as a clean base load. So it, it can be reliable and also do load following very well. Cleaner, 100% carbon free, as clean as wind and solar, smaller footprint, safer, should it become necessary for the new scale small modular reactor to shut down, it can shut itself down and cool itself and keep itself cool indefinitely without any operator action, without any additional water and without any AC or DC power. And to the point about being cost competitive, again, the module is built, the reactor itself is built in a factory parallel to the civil works that are going on in the field. So comparing to a, a typical uh, a traditional nuclear power plant where all of those activities are in series, these activities are in parallel, which uh, it, roughly speaking cuts the uh, construction time in half. Next slide, please. Uh, so we talk a little bit about applications uh, as far as utilizing nuclear energy for oil refineries, both as a power source 
as well as uh, utilizing the steam, uh, say, for example, in, in certain applications where uh, extracting oil shale, or extracting oil from oil shale is, is desired. Again, oil companies are very much looking at ways to reduce their carbon footprint and evaluating nuclear energy is, is one of those ways. Uh, we talked a little bit about hydrogen production. Um, one um, uh, new scale module can produce about 50 tons per day of hydrogen. Uh, we could talk about a little bit about desalination. Uh, one module can produce about 77 million gallons per day of water. And I would add that given the design of the plant, the fact that these modules fit into a building, our design that we uh, were had approved from the NRC is for a 12 module configuration. You can have some subset of modules support oil refineries, a second subset support hydrogen production, a third desalination, you know, again, electricity, load following, lots of flexibilities because with each module, you have its own shaft, own power conversion system, and that flexibility can be used to support the grid and the uh, surrounding ecosystem. And I had mentioned earlier about mission critical facilities. Just a little demonstration here about what we mean by load following and the capabilities of, of this plant. And this is really borne by the fact that the turbine generator is relatively small, commercial grade. We're taking 250 megawatts thermal from the uh, module, uh, hooking it up to its own uh, dedicated power conversion system, yielding 77 megawatts electricity. These turbine generators are commercial grade. Uh, they're, easy, they're very, very easily available, nothing special about them. But what's also true is that you can do 100% turbine bypass and dump steam um, you know, from the condenser. So if you, as, as you look at this graph, the top line, the darkest line is the typical demand or the demand in this particular area on, on this day. The blue line at the bottom shows the output from, uh, from a, a wind farm in Idaho. And, you can, and we actually picked a gusty day on purpose to be able to demonstrate this and see what the capabilities are. So the, the blue line, that bottom line, um, it's the wind coming and going, if you will. And then the green line demonstrates uh, the new scale plant's ability to respond to the output of the wind farm. So essentially what you're looking at here is you want the blue line and the green line to add up to the, to, to the dark, dark green line or black line. So uh, the responsiveness of, of this plant, and again, new scales of the opinion, I think most folks are of the opinion, that in order to deal with climate change and deal with the greenhouse gas emission issues, uh, all of the above is, is uh, solutions will be required. And that means integrating with a variety of energy generation sources. Uh, next slide, please. Uh, just a little bit about our trail to commercialization. This is uh, my friend, Yukon Jack, he's getting to the peak. Uh, we talked about the program starting in 2000, or at least uh, the, the evaluation of the technology in 2000. Uh, some noteworthy uh, dates in here um, include uh, the uh, NRC approval of our simulator. That was a key uh, event from the standpoint that we're able to use the demonstrator again to demonstrate our technology to the NRC. Ultimately, the NRC found that uh, you know the technology did meet the requirements. It also is used in, in forming our staffing plan, which is, a, which is an important element in determining the levelized cost of electricity, the LCOE. So uh, we, we've uh, also benefited from the uh, uh, simulator and developing training programs. So the technology and our ability to deploy uh, this technology is, is, is fairly advanced and uh, the simulator was very useful in helping us uh, accomplish that. Moving forward, uh, you know, we, we are actually uh, performing manufacturing trials as we speak in a number of fabrication facilities. We are planning on ordering forgings in the first quarter of 2022, initiating fabrication in 2022. Uh, and uh, we can go to the next slide, I think. Uh, I'm just gonna talk a little bit about the licensing effort that's behind us. As I mentioned, uh, this is an evolutionary technology, uh, but even with that, it was a significant level of effort in order to gain the design certification. So I think it's noteworthy to share a little bit about what that level of effort was. The design certification itself was completed in December of 2016. It was docketed in March of 2017 and received approval, as, as we mentioned, uh, late August 1st of September 2022. The application itself required, a, it consisted of over 12,000 pages, 14 topical reports, 2 million labor, 2 million labor hours, and over $500 million in cost. 
So to the extent, as we mentioned earlier, that floor participating, providing the funding, providing the, the, the support, and I have said be able to accomplish this uh, very, very well appreciated and certainly a key factor in allowing us to be in a position to deploy our technology. Uh, next slide, please. And just a word about our project, UAMPS, uh, Utah Associated Municipal Power Systems. Uh, they're a joint action agency. Um, they are uh, have 49 members in the Western states, 28 of which are CFPP participants. But I would also add that there are additional participants looking at subscribing to the project beyond their immediate area in Montana, Wyoming, Arizona, and Washington. Uh, this will be our first deployment. It is on INL lands, uh, INL National Labs, and uh, we're under contract and we're, we're getting to work. So we're very excited about that. So the next slide, just a little bit about the timetable. Uh, right now we are doing site characterization work, uh, continuing to do that through 2024, mobilizing in 24, having our first module installed in 2029, and completing the project in 2030. So uh, I'll stop there. It took about 12 minutes and uh, available for questions later on if, 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 uh, if there are any. Thank you, Jeff. I'll turn it back to you. Don, Don, thank you very much. Appreciate uh, that presentation and, and uh, glad we were able to get through the technical issues. Um, with that, I want to turn to John Ball, who is Executive Vice President of GE Hitachi Nuclear Energy. And um, while we're waiting for John to come online, uh, we'll switch the slides over to his deck. Great to be uh, with you today uh, to talk about some of the development we're doing. Uh, around our small modular reactor called the BWR X300. Um, a little bit about GE's history in nuclear. Uh, we got involved in uh, the nuclear um, industry right from the very onset. Um, in fact, early days of uh, the discovery of fission back in the late 30s. We did form our atomic energy, uh, later called our nuclear energy division in the mid 50s. And we've had a number of, of firsts. Um, starting with uh, the very first licensed uh, reactor, the Vallecitos boiling water reactor that has license number one from the Atomic Energy Commission uh, back in 1957. Um, and then in 1962, we were part of a consortium that included AECL in Canada, in, uh, in addition to Ontario Hydro, uh, now known as Ontario Power Generation, to deploy the first reactor in Canada called the uh, Nuclear Power Demonstration Unit that served as the basis for the CANDU fleet uh, that has been operating very reliably and well in Canada uh, since then. And then also had the first generation three technology that was deployed in Japan, the Advanced Boiling Water Reactor in 1996. Um, and this was a first of a kind design um, that was delivered on time, on budget. Our focus uh, today is around small modular reactors and advanced reactors. And we have two technologies that we're developing. Uh, the first is a light water SMR called the BWR X300. And that's going to be the focus of uh, the rest of my presentation today. But I do want to note, and you heard Jeff uh, in his uh, opening presentation mentioned the different technologies being developed. We're also in partnership with TerraPower on the natrium design, which is a sodium fast reactor that received uh, funding from the Department of Energy under the Advanced Reactor Demonstration Program. And we're excited about uh, that partnership and the long term prospects of that technology. Um, so uh, let me uh, now turn. Uh, the, the focus here to the BWR X300. And um, a little bit why we started focusing on small modular reactors. And back in the 2017 timeframe, we recognized that the future of nuclear had to look different. If you consider the, the projects that were taking place in South Carolina, in Georgia, over budget, way past schedule, uh, recognized that um, the future um, had, to, had to be different. So we pulsed a number of customers in the U.S., in Canada, in Europe. And what we heard is that in order for nuclear to be relevant going forward, um, it had to be cost competitive. 
and cost competitive with all forms of generation. We've heard um, a number of speakers today already talk about the importance of driving uh, cost competitive nuclear solutions. And then the other one was there really wasn't an appetite to invest more than a billion dollars in a in a new plant. Um, we also heard that um, that they wanted a technology that was licensable in the near term and in nuclear near term really is over the course of a decade. And so that really had us focus on light water reactor technology, just given the pedigree associated with the technology, the licensability, the availability of proven fuel uh, led us to focus in this area. So we started with a licensed design from uh, the ESBWR, which was certified by the US NRC back in 2014. We took it and not only made it smaller, um, and I think you know Simon highlighted the, the issue with just going smaller, you lose economies of scale and on a per megawatt basis, a reactor could actually get more expensive by trying to shrink its size. And so we recognize the absolute uh, importance of simplification. And I'm going to talk about how we've dramatically simplified this design versus prior uh, iterations of the boiling water reactor technology. Um, we've in, employed a design to cost approach. We see through the simplification a, a, an ability to significantly reduce our capital costs on a per megawatt basis. Um, there's been a lot of discussion around load following um, this design we've modeled versus the California duck curve and is able to ramp up and down um, in unison with that with that duck curve. Ideal, not only for electricity generation, but also in dust, other industrial applications like hydrogen production. And we've initiated licensing both in the US and Canada with a uh, line of sight to be operational by 2028. So a little more about the technology and just real high level on boiling water reactor technology. Uh, BWRs are inherently simple to start with. In fact, if you think about most nuclear energy systems, uh, the simplest in that it doesn't require the need for a secondary steam system. Um, it's a direct cycle system. And so essentially the way it operates, you flow water over the fuel, Water serves as a coolant, uh, but also by passing over the, the fuel, it's converted into steam. That steam is then passed to the turbine um, where uh, the turbine um, generator generates electricity. The water condenses and you'd pass it back over the fuel. Um, and so we've taken this, um, this very inherently simple system, and we've taken it to the next level to drive a cost competitive solution. And we've done that through a new innovation called the integral isolation valve. Uh, this has now been patented and it's been approved by the US NRC. So we submitted a licensed topical report describing this change in going from the ESBWR to the BWR X300. Um, and it's this technology that enables this dramatic simplification of our, of our design, which um, enables uh, more than 50% reduction in construction materials. It's concrete, steel on a per megawatt basis, which is really the main driver in cost for, for new nuclear. Um, essentially, the way this valve works is, and you're looking at the top of the reactor vessel, and off each side of the reactor vessel is the uh, main steam lines that go to the turbine. And what happens um, with this technology is in the event you have a break, um, the potential for a what's called a loss of coolant accident, um, this would immediately detect uh, such an event and then isolate, keeping all of the uh, coolant inside the reactor. Uh, it turns out in the decades of operation of a boiling water reactor, we've never had such a, an accident, a loss of coolant accident. Um, and so we've uh, determined a way um, to essentially eliminate that potential accident scenario, leading to significant simplification, which you can see highlighted on this page. So on the left side is the ESBWR, large reactor, 1500 megawatts. On the right side is the BWR X300, 
300 megawatts electric, smaller, much simpler. Um, what you see on the ESPWR is in the blue shaded regions. These are large backup cooling systems, massive safety systems in the event you have what's called a loss of coolant accident. Um, and so because we've designed that scenario out of um, the reactor, um, those systems are no longer needed and can be eliminated. And so that has led us to reducing the total building volume by 90% compared to existing nuclear while still maintaining 20% of the output. So we get significant leverage from a cost perspective, a 50% reduction in building volume and cost essentially on a per megawatt basis. Now, you know, this is a, a technology that's a, it's an ideal balance between breakthrough innovation that I just described with that integral isolation valve coupled with proven technology. And given that the BWR X300 is the 10th generation boiling water reactor, we're able to build on the decades of experience and essentially 90% of the, um, of the nuclear island um, are all proven components operated before same components, same materials, just a smaller version of exactly the same. And that's what you see here. Um, importantly is the fuel that we're utilizing is uh, utilized in today's fleet. Um, over 70% of the global boiling water reactor fleet has utilized a fuel type called GNF2, which we manufacture in Wilmington, North Carolina. We've manufactured over 20,000 of these fuel assemblies. Very reliable. Um, and what's important here is it takes a significant amount of time in terms of bringing new fuel types to market, to design them, to license them. And our experience is it takes a minimum of 10 years um, to do that. And so uh, in order to bring new reactor technology to market in a rapid fashion, uh, requires that you have fuel availability that's reliable and that there's cost certainty associated with that fuel. Um, also uh, important is the way in which we construct a plant. And this is going to be significantly different than the way we've constructed plants in the past. Um, we recently won an award from the Department of Energy at the um, National Reactor Innovation Center, NREC, out in Idaho to demonstrate a completely new construction technique uh, that we're confident is going to be a game changer for the nuclear industry. So in, in conventional nuclear, it requires that you do a mass excavation of a site, um, and then you bring in engineered backfill before you even start pouring concrete. That process is extremely time consuming and very expensive. It's been completely eliminated in this design. And what we um, are proposing is a circular shaft, and you can see the reactor in the center of this page um, will be constructed underground. That um, enables the uh, much faster uh, construction using techniques that are used in industries around the world today, the tunneling industry, mining, um, that we're gonna demonstrate via this uh, project at NREC for nuclear. Also using uh, uh, catalog items, off the, shelf, uh, off the shelf items. Great example of this is our turbine generator, which has been used uh, hundreds of times in, in combined cycle gas units around the world. Um, and then a little bit about our partnerships, um, both here in the US and abroad, um, a lot of uh, interest in this technology. Um, it's resonated in the market, the cost competitiveness, the and the ability to leverage um, so much that's proven um, in the boiling water reactor technology. Um, you heard a lot about Ontario power generation, uh, you know, from the others. Um, we're part one of three, um, and OPG is going to make a final selection um, at the end of this year. Um, we've initiated licensing both in the US and Canada, and we applaud the memorandum of cooperation that you've heard of between our two regulators to really streamline licensing across both countries. And we've initiated uh, pre-licensing discussions in Poland, which we anticipate being uh, the potential for a very large market for SMRs. So with that, thank you for your time and look forward to the Q&A at the end.
John, thank you very much. Really appreciate your, your walking through that and a lot of interesting innovation. Um, I know you've got some partners here in the Carolinas too, helping you out. So we'll love to hear some more about that down the line. Um, next, I want to go to Jeff Harper, who is the Vice President of Business Development for X Energy, uh, based out of Rockville, Maryland. Jeff, are you with us? I am, Jeff. Can you hear me? I can hear you very well. Okay. Greetings. Greetings. Thanks so much. I appreciate it. Um, congratulations to E4 Carolinas for such a great uh, conversation today. Uh, really appreciate that. And also, a uh, special shout out to you, Jeff Merrifield. Uh, you've been a great champion of the industry change agent. Uh, so, thanks very much. Appreciate it. Thank you, Jeff. So, uh, here to talk to you about X Energy today. Um, X Energy is a high temperature gas reactor development company and uh, and also we produce the uh, trisol fuel to go along with that. Um, our real short term focus, if you will, objective would be uh, really uh, simply stated uh, deployment uh, this decade. So again, we're laser focused on deploying uh, simple cost competitive uh, nuclear solutions this decade. Um, okay, uh, you can go to the next one, Bonnie. Oh, when I do these talks, and, and if you've heard my talks before, you probably have seen this slide, I, I like to take a step back and really remind us all, including myself, that uh, you know, nuclear energy is just a, 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 an outstanding uh, source of, of energy for uh, electricity, process heat, et cetera. Um, if you look at the uh, power density, um, it's just remarkable. Uh, our, our fuel element happens to be a pebble here, and I'm showing that on this slide. Um, if you look at it uh, in terms of, you know, clean energy, uh, it's, it's really unequal in terms of uh, uh, energy density. You look at the equivalency, uh, our, our fuel element here as shown, um, it's really the size of a billiard ball. Uh, we're looking at the equivalent of 2.66 metric tons of coal. Um, you know, eight metric tons of CO2 and about 0.8 metric tons of ash. And that's just a remarkable, uh, remarkable stats. And uh, we're finding a way to harness that for commercial use. Uh, okay, you can go to the next one. For those of you who haven't heard about X Synergy or don't know uh, exactly what we do, we have four lines. Uh, a business. Uh, we have our workhorse uh, uh, product, which is the XE100. And again, high temperature gas reactor uh, with pebble bed fuel, pebble fuel. Um, and we, it, it comes in modules. So uh, we have uh, a module being uh, 80 megawatts electric. Our standard plant would be four of those modules, uh, making 320 megawatts electric. Um, and then we have a, a mobile reactor, uh, I can call it XE1, and it's approximately one megawatt uh, electric. And uh, this reactor solution is pretty much focused exclusively on uh, Department of Defense, uh, Defense. Um, and uh, so we're very excited about uh, about that. And then we have uh, what we call Trisol X. So we do manufacture the, uh, the Trisol fuel. Uh, we manufacture it in different fuel forms, um, one being the pebble for X Energy, but we're also uh, able to produce that and prismatic and planks, et cetera. And finally, we are um, in space applications. Uh, so we're looking at nuclear for, uh, for uh, uh, thermal nuclear, uh, nuclear thermal propulsion. 
and also fission power for lunar surfaces. Okay, we can go to the next one. Gas reactors are nothing new. Um, and, you know, they've been around since 1944 with uh, a series of uh, operational operational you know, uh, applications and starting back with the Dragon Reactor in the UK um, all the way up till now. Um, you know, the Chinese uh, basically have a test reactor that's it's already been deployed in 2000. Um, they keep threatening with their uh, commercial reactor, which uh, they tell us will be deployed this year. Uh, but prior to that would be the German reactor with the THTR and the ADR. Uh, both reactors ran for you know, approximately 20 years. So a lot of the um, a lot of the the uh, development that's done uh, these days, uh, whether it had been in South Africa, their 15 year experience, or uh, even well China, uh, even Japan, it, it really based on the German experience. So uh, again, the message here is that you know. This is not a new technology, and what X Energy is attempting to do is to really um, focus on the economic case, uh, since the technology is so mature, uh, to bring the, the, this technology to market uh, in a rapid pace. Next. So Jeff uh, mentioned this up front uh, in terms of trisol fuel um, and the robust nature of it. it in fact, it's meltdown proof. Um, and that's because of the, uh, the materials involved. I mean, we have uh, mostly graphite here. You've got ceramic layers, but then you have uh, a ceramic layer, a silicon carbide that really encapsulates the triso particle and within the triso, well, the triso particle itself are in our case is UCO, and that's where you get the fission reactions. Uh, but that that silicon carbide layer is essentially replacing uh, the traditional containment building. Uh, ninety nine percent, ninety nine point nine nine percent of the radio nucleides are captured within. Within that, uh, within that layer, that silicon carbide layer. So actually, we believe that this fuel, uh, this triso fuel, is a game changer in terms of uh, safety, safety case. And our safety case really is, is all about this fuel. It's built around this fuel. So that's, that's very unique, and it helps us uh, in terms of designing and cutting cost in our reactor solution. Okay, fine, next. Just a word about the, uh, the, the XE100 here. Uh, again, I mentioned uh, the modularity of it, uh, coming 80 uh, modules of 80 megawatts electric. We put four together for our best uh, economic case. Uh, however, we were free to add or subtract modules as the demand would require. Um, the unique part about this solution, uh, well, actually high temperature gas reactors, is that you the quality of steam that you can get from from these reactors. Uh, in our case, uh, five hundred. Uh, 545 degrees centigrade steam uh, at 16.5 MPA. Um, you have the flexibility of using this for hydrogen production, desalinization, uh, and various other uh, petrochemical applications, uh, district heating as well. Um, as others that spoke today, our solution also allows us to load follow. 
So in our case, we're looking at 5% per minute uh, and a low and a ramping from 40, well, from 100% uh, percent to 40% percent and back again. So very unique. Um, and we're finding that uh, applications beyond electricity will make a major uh, contribution um, going forward for this technology. Okay, next. This is an old study done in the UK by the National Nuclear Laboratory. Um, I like to I like this study. Uh, basically, it just says that the, the markets are huge, and uh, you know we're looking at uh, you know a market where there's space. I believe for all SMRs and a tremendous opportunity going forward in the future. Next. Which builds and, and takes us to now what our main objective, short term objective, at least at X Energy is to be deployed this decade. We have uh, three ways to do that. The first would be for our micro reactor. Um, we have, uh, we were selected, down selected with BWXT for uh, a potential 300 megawatt um, market going to 2040. So DOD is, is expected to make a decision whether or not they'll use both solutions or they'll use one of us early next year. Um, both uh, Simon and John mentioned uh, that we are down selected, uh, the three of us on the OPG opportunity in Canada. And as they both stated, we will learn this year um, where how OPG wants to go forward. Um, finally, we are also uh, we're down selected uh, as final winners with uh, the uh, Department of Energy uh, Advanced Reactor Demonstration Program, and this we were uh, selected with uh, Terra Power. Um, Department of Energy offered up uh, 1.2 billion dollars for X Energy's project. That would be 50% of the entire cost of the project um, for this uh, for this particular opportunity. And if you go to the next slide, I think that's my final one, Jeff. Um, <clears throat> this just talks more about the project itself. Um, and the key here that I just want to amplify real quick is that the project will be um, uh, in Washington State. We are partnered with Energy Northwest. Um, in this project, and uh, we are looking at a 2027 deployment date. Uh, and I failed to mention that the deployment scheduled deployment date for the OPG opportunity is 2028. Jeff, I think uh, my time is over. Great, Jeff, and I really appreciate it. What, what I'd like right now, we are we are just about out of time, so I think I'm going to ask one question, um, and I'm I'm going to ask all of our participants uh, the same question. So, John, uh, Dom, Simon, if you could uh, click back on, are you all there? I'll let, I'll let Jeff go first, and then you guys can answer as well. But the real question is this, I mean, this conference is focused on South Carolina and, and its potential deployment of advanced nuclear technologies. And, 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 and really in a short sum, you know, do you think there's, you know, what are the things that South Carolina should consider about advanced nuclear? And do you see this uh, area as an area just for deployment, uh, nuclear supply or both? Start with you, Jeff. Yeah, I think it's, I think it's uh, uh, an area for both. Actually, you saw the, the slide I put up about the potential market going forward. I think it's a huge opportunity. I'm aware that uh, from a fuel uh, waste uh, point of view that uh, I think it's Savannah River site is actually looking at uh, recapturing some of the fuel element from the German experience, uh, the German experience, and uh, just you know uh, trying to to deal with that. So there's a lot of opportunities, and I think uh, what, what better place in South uh, South Carolina to 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 uh, to harness those opportunities. 
Great. Dom, are you still on the line? Dom, are you there? Can you hear me now? Can hear you now. Yeah, same question to you. Not great. So, uh, yeah, so I think all of the above. So, as, as, as I mentioned earlier, we maybe I, maybe you didn't hear me, but um, New Scale has an office in Charlotte. Uh, we're using a, Charlotte is and in, in the Carolina areas is very rich. I would almost call it the Silicon Valley of, of the nuclear industry in some ways, because there's a great heritage here. EPRI is here. There are not a number of uh, members of the nuclear ecosystem. Uh, and so, to the extent that there is talent in the area, and to the extent that that talent could be utilized from an engineering point of view or a uh, professional uh, point of view, absolutely. The other thing I would add, and, and we've, we've, we've identified and detailed out, you know, with floor, uh, you know, what's required as far as deploying and building a plant. And when you talk about concrete and piping and, and, and uh, electrical uh, components and things of that nature, a lot of those things don't travel well. So to the extent that, you know, you would have an impact on the local economy, on the, on the top tier uh, vendors, uh, sub tier vendors as well. Uh, yeah, the door is wide open. And uh, again, we're, we're not a, uh, an equipment manufacturer, so we'll be relying very heavily on that supply chain and helping develop it as well. Great, terrific. Uh, Simon, I know you've recently located your headquarters in Charlotte. So uh, any, any thoughts there? So uh, yes, one thought and one word to keep it short. Uh, um, Jeff is is both, um, both the opportunity to deploy, and the supply chain opportunity as well. We're a technology company looking to innovate, and that requires us to get strong support from the, from the supply chain and source from a sophisticated labour pool. Uh, the Carolinas offer all those things to us. Great, thank you, Simon, and well, John. Uh... You've got an enormous footprint in, in GH in, in, in Wilmington, North Carolina. So I, I think uh, probably the answer here is pretty obvious, but certainly get, like to get your thoughts uh, on the opportunities here in, in South Carolina. Yeah, uh, agree with what's been stated, certainly both. And I, I would say as far as deployment goes, and I think this was touched on in, in your opening session, Jeff, I, I do think there's a great opportunity for coal replacement in South Carolina. You know, South Carolina is a state already that um, um, has deployed nuclear. They have clean energy goals going forward, and there's going to be roughly a couple gigawatts of coal generation that are going to be retired um, here in the late 2020s. John, thank you very much. And, and I want to thank all of our panelists today. Uh, I think, as you've seen, there are some very exciting technologies out there. Um, clearly, advanced nuclear is a rising tide. Uh, that is hopefully going to lift all of these terrific technologies forward uh, with a number of reactors being built. Um, with that, I want to uh, uh, turn to our next panel. Uh, I'm going to pass the baton to Zachary McDaniel, who's the Director of Advanced Fuels for Westinghouse. We'll have a little, little bit of a different discussion about different elements of advanced nuclear technology. With that, uh, Zachary, are you, are you here online? Yes. How's it going? Thank you, Jeff. Terrific. Thank you. And I uh, turn turn the dais over to you. Great. Um, so I'd like to start off as well, thanking E4 Carolinas for the opportunity to moderate this panel session today. Uh, as you can see on the screen, we have a great panel here uh, with representation across the, um, the U.S. for uh, just the new plants um, where we're looking with uh, Craig and EPRI and what we're looking at for new reactors. Um, so, Craig is the program manager for advanced nuclear technology at EPRI. Uh, we have Julianne Edwards, um, who is coming to us from Energy Solutions as a senior vice president. Uh, Mark Sartain, the vice president for nuclear engineering and fleet support from Dominion. And Chris Nolan, he's the vice president, nuclear regulatory affairs, policy and emergency preparedness at Duke Energy. Um, so, as Jeff mentioned, I am the director for advanced fuels at Westinghouse. Um, so we do have a large presence at Westinghouse in the Carolinas, uh, specifically in uh, South Carolina, we have our fuel fabrication facility in Columbia. So a lot of effort uh, that we have going on there and being growing up in the fuel side myself um, have been to uh, South Carolina uh, quite often, um, enjoy going there. And we have a, a large staff there that, that's working to fuel um, the plants in the U.S. and globally uh, to advance nuclear power. Um, 
specifically my role in advanced um, for uh, advanced fuels is looking to advance not only the existing LWR fleet and optimize products for that fleet, but also look at advanced fuel solutions as well for the next reactors for the advanced reactor products. So looking at uh, both utilization of TRISO as we've discussed here, as other advanced fuel forms and uh, fuel materials and what is the best solution moving forward for these reactor concepts, both the reactor concepts that Westinghouse is designing. Uh, we have the Avinci micro reactor as well as our LFR small modular reactor um, and also through collaborations and partnerships with other reactor designers and uh, players in the advanced nuclear realm. So uh, looking forward to hearing what the panel has to say here today and excited to be a moderator. Um, as we've seen through the last couple sessions, uh, we have a lot of great content from the slides, so we may not have time to get to all the questions. So I would ask that you please type your questions in the chat, as Bonnie mentioned at the outset of the meeting. Um, and if we don't have time to cover those in, in exchange after the summary of the presentations, then I'd please ask the presenters to take a look and uh, review the chat and respond to those as you're able. All right. With that, I will turn it over to Craig Stover. So, Craig, are you on the line? I'm here. Can you hear me? Great. Yes. Thank you. All right. Thanks a lot, Zach. Uh, so, I'm Craig Stover. I'm the program manager for the Advanced Nuclear Technology Program uh, at EPRI. Uh, really pleased to be here today. Uh, really excited to address a South Carolina audience. Uh, South Carolina is actually my home state. I'm a proud graduate of the University of South Carolina. So. Uh, it's really uh, great to kind of come back home today and, and, and talk to some fellow South Carolinians. Um, I always start these talks actually with a with a football quote, and it's actually, if you're from South Carolina, you might know Steve Spurrier, one of our most famous football coaches. Um, and I always start them with these talks, but it's really applicable to this audience since some of you might actually be familiar with it. But one of the one of the quotes that that Steve Spurrier always had was right before football season starts, a lot of people call that talking season. Right, you haven't played any games. Um, you know, there's no wins or losses, and so a lot of people are talking about what we might do, and so that's talking season. But he used to always say, eventually, you know, talking season has to stop, and you have to play the games, right? And so, uh, for a long time in advanced nuclear space and uh, advanced re reactor space, we've kind of been in talking season. Um, but talking season's really over for advanced reactors, um, and it's actually time to build these plants. Uh, and as you'll as you've heard today, and as you'll see in my presentation, you know, uh, advanced reactors are really here, uh, and so it's it's time to go build these plants, and that's that's really exciting for us. Uh, so next slide. So I always like to start here, um, you know. So again, for those of us that have worked in advanced nuclear for a long time, it always seemed like advanced reactors were something way out in the future, but that's really not the case anymore. Um, it's hard to believe. Um, sometimes I feel like I'm living in the future when I realize it's 2021, about to be 2022. Um, but, you know, we are in the 2020s. We always said by the 2020s we'd be deploying advanced reactors, uh, and we are. So in this decade, um, just in the United States and Canada, and, and you know, we support uh, plants all over the world, but just in the U.S. and Canada, we're going to deploy micro reactors. We're going to deploy non-light water reactors. Um, and light water small modular reactors. And actually, the previous panel really spoke to that beautifully. So we're going to deploy all of these technologies in North America in effectively the next eight years. Um, and so it's really, it's, it's really not um, just something we're talking about anymore. There are a lot of real projects with real contracts, with real customers, real designs. Um, and uh, there's a tremendous amount of work going on both in the U.S. and around the world to make this happen. Uh, and so really the time to prepare for our advanced reactor future really, really is now. Uh, and so um, if, if you remember one thing from my talk, just remember that it's it's really not something that's way out in the future. They, these technologies really are here. Um, and the decisions we make as an industry in this decade will have a huge impact uh, on the future fleet of nuclear plants. Um, in the decades to come. Next slide. 
So just briefly, briefly a little bit about EPRI and a little bit about uh, my program uh, at EPRI. So for those of you that are not familiar with EPRI, we are a nonprofit um, research organization. So we are a nonprofit. We are the pub for the public good. Um, uh, we are a member-based collaborative organization. So uh, in specifically in the nuclear portion of EPRI, about 80% of the world's uh, commercial nuclear um, operators are, are members of, of EPRI, um, representing about 46 utilities um, from around the world. Uh, and in my program, in the Advanced Nuclear Technology Program, uh, we have all 46 of those utilities, as well as um, over 20 uh, advanced reactor developers, you know, and then other folks in the advanced nuclear supply chain. So all, all told, uh, in the Advanced Nuclear Technology Program at EPRI, we've got more than 60 companies uh, creating one of the broadest collaborative environments on, on a new nuclear research uh, in the industry. So the goal of our program is really to accelerate the deployment of nuclear power around the world. Uh, frankly, that means we are working as hard as we can to make it possible to build these plants faster and to build them cheaper. Uh, and so we we definitely understand um, the challenge, uh, you know, and um, and are trying to make sure we do everything we can to to uh, support deploying these technologies. Uh, our work really falls into four key areas. Um, the first one, and this is kind of an exciting one, is around informing resource planning. Um, a couple of years ago, actually, this box would not have been on this slide, um, but as I tell folks. Uh, the phone is really ringing again, and that's because, as many of you know, uh, over the last two years, there's a huge emphasis on um, carbon reduction uh, and those types of in initiatives. Uh, and frankly, uh, as folks begin to look at how are they how are they going to decarbonize by 2040, 2050, uh, it, it's becoming clear pretty quick that nuclear and specifically advanced nuclear has a very important role to play uh, in decarbonization. And so in our role in supporting our members, we're trying to help folks understand, okay, if you want to build a nuclear plant in 10 years, 15 years, if that's a part of your resource plan, uh, what do you need to know today? Um, and what do you need to know to make that decision? Uh, and so we are, we're doing that. We, we are also working with a lot of uh, what we call non-nuclear operators. Um, but a lot of the folks that might operate nuclear plants in the future are either utilities, uh, maybe in states that today don't have nuclear, um, that might want to employ a nuclear plant, uh, or it might be, um, you know, uh, industry, right? Um, uh, so, you know, so a, a non-electric mission for a nuclear plant. So we've we've got a bunch of resources we've developed uh, to in, inform uh, that resource planning. Uh, the core piece of our work is technology development. Um, so we close a lot of technical gaps on these designs to move them forward. Um, Probably the area that we get the most questions about, and I'll spend some time on it here today, is around reducing deployment costs. So certainly we we understand that if you can't afford to build these plants, it doesn't matter how well they operate. Um, and so we've got a, a huge portion of our resource portfolio uh, directed at reducing deployment costs. That's a huge focus for us. We spend a lot of time in this industry talking about the nuclear piece of these plants, um, but for the most part, deployment costs is all about civil structural it's about number of days on site, concrete and rebar. And so we've got a, a big piece of our portfolio looking at the civil structural piece. Um, a lot of work on advanced manufacturing, trying to reinvent the nuclear supply chain. And then finally, as we look to start up a lot of plants that are of novel designs that maybe we've never operated commercially before, uh, we've got a lot of work underway um, developing commissioning uh, guidance for these new plants. Uh, so all told, you know, in the program today, we have over 40 ongoing projects uh, supporting uh, deploying advanced reactors. Next slide. There we go. Uh, so we, we do a number of economic studies as well in the program, and, and this one's actually publicly available. So if you um, go to the EPRI website, you can actually download this report from from 2018, but effectively what this report did was look at the penetration of new nuclear um, in the U.S. Um, based on, you know, uh, the price of electricity. And so these little dots here represent the dollar per kilowatt. Um, and you can see that we have run this on various scenarios, right, with reference or higher low gas prices, a carbon policy, um, expanded uh, renewable um, portfolios. 
But the really interesting one, and it's come up a lot today in the chat, uh, is around revenue, uh, right? And so we talk a lot about using nuclear to make electricity, but the non-electric missions for these plants um, have a really important role to play. Um, and frankly, when you do things like make hydrogen or make ammonia, do some of these other things, um, they're actually higher revenue sources potentially than electricity. Um, and so that has the potential too to be a game changer in the way we talk about the cost of plants. Um, because in some cases, um, you know, it's, we, we find additional revenue sources for these plants. So, um, and then we also find additional value. So there's a, a number of other contributors that, that go to the cost of plants. But as we run these scenarios, you can see um, as the, the as the dollar per kilowatt comes down, um, all the models point to significant new nuclear needs all the way through 2050. Um, so certainly there's a ton of potential here for new nuclear. Uh, next slide. So I'll touch on this briefly because I think uh, the previous presenters have, have done a very a really good job today. Um, but as we talk about the benefits of advanced reactors, you know, we're not just talking about the grid scale gigawatt size uh, reactors of of the past, right? So we we're, we're talking about anywhere from you know a, a one megawatt micro reactor, you know, all the way up to gigawatt size, but in everything in between. And as we look at the technologies, um, there's just incredible flexibility to meet the need uh, to meet the need of your local community, um, to meet the need of local uh, industry. Uh, it, to meet the need in like where you can locate these plants, for example, maybe close to an urban area with some of these new designs. Um, and so there's just incredible flexibility. So it's not a one size fits all kind of market anymore. There's tremendous opportunities in the market for the specific uh, application. Next slide. So one of the questions we get a lot is, you know, what, what will it take to commercialize advanced reactors? Uh, and so certainly one of the, the key things in commercializing advanced, re advanced reactors is you have to have technologies that are mature. And you heard a lot today about the demonstrations that are happening, um, you know, over the next few years with these technologies. And certainly that goes a long way to maturing these designs. Uh, you also need technologies that are compelling. Uh, and so, again, uh, and actually the chat's been great. You know, people have talked about things like high temperature, uh, and deployment flexibility in terms of location, non-electric missions, you know, so there are a lot of compelling new attributes, um, maybe autonomous operation, some of those types of things. Um, certainly competitive cost and value. So it's not just cost, it's about value. And certainly the role in decarbonization is playing a big part of that today. Um, but you also need customers who, you know, understand, right? Understand. Uh, their future grid demand, understand their future carbon goals, and understand the role that nuclear can play in a clean energy future. Um, and so conversations like the one we're having today are incredibly important uh, because that goes a long way to helping folks understand that, hey, nuclear's, you know, these new nuclear technologies, you know, um, you know, provide a lot of options for my organization to meet our carbon goals, to meet our load goals into the future and to start planning for those. Um, uh, and so, you know, uh, EPRI is kind of uniquely positioned. So one of the, uh, that, you know, we have 80% of the world's commercial nuclear fleet working with us today, and that really helps us hopefully prepare the next generation of, of operators. Um, and we do things like one of the, one of the key guides that, that we have is something we call the owner operator, uh, requirements guide. And so we, we've, we've got an initiative and, and actually it's something that we're going to be um, revising here shortly, but where we really try to get these reactor developers and the potential end users to the same table uh, and try to help both sides understand um, the needs, right? So that ideally we end up with technologies that um, the end users want and vice versa uh, and try to put those uh, requirements kind of on paper. And so, um, you know, we really are do doing what we can to help here. Next slide. Sorry, next slide. There we go. Uh, so we, we, you know, I talked about deployment costs um, and certainly we absolutely understand that in, in the economic st studies, like I highlighted earlier, certainly point to 
you know, certainly kind of the ranges of costs that nuclear plants need to fall into to be competitive in the market. Um, and there's other factors um, coming into play today that, that are helping there as well. But ultimately, we've got to be able to build nuclear plants um, faster and we have to be able to build them cheaper. Uh, and, uh, you know, we certainly believe that's possible. Uh, and a lot of these new designs have um, attributes um, that certainly enhance their constructability as well. So there's a lot of things at play here. Um, but we did a report a couple of years ago um, that was an economic based roadmap for our research. And so effectively, we looked at what are the top five cost drivers uh, for nuclear construction? Um, and so construction task duration certainly is the biggest civil structural design constructability. All of those go together, um, but ultimately a, a plant that is easy to construct in a short manner drives the cost. And so those first three columns there um, are really important. Also, and then you get into things like materials, which includes manufacturing and then inspection. Um, and so we really see these as the five key cost drivers for these plants. And so we looked at that and then we looked at the work that we thought we could do and what kind of impact could we have on the cost of a plant. Uh, and what we determined is we we think just based in these five areas, and this is actually based on um, uh, you know kind of advanced light water designs, larger plants. But there was about three thousand dollars per kilowatt in savings that could be reduced through technology development in these five areas. Um, so that really guides so much of the work we do at Every. Um, and so when we look at um, when you look at these uh, columns, you'll notice that uh, we have a lot of work ongoing. We have a lot of work complete, but uh, the biggest story here is that we certainly understand that the cost of the plants is the problem, and we're focusing as much effort as we can in our portfolio to do what we can to reduce uh, to reduce that cost. Uh, next slide. So finally, um, you know, advanced manufacturing. So. Advanced manufacturing does represent a way uh, to reduce, you know, costs. Um, can, it, it can significantly reduce the cost of your major nuclear components. Uh, something like a reactor vessel, for example, typically could take three, four, or five years to manufacture. Um, with some of the technologies that we're demonstrating at Epri, we think we can demonstrate that you could do that in less than a year. Um, but more so, advanced manufacturing represents a way to create a much more resilient supply chain for nuclear, uh, and that's that's important. Uh, and so we've got a lot of work uh, underway. Um, we're actually, we have a project right now, we're demonstrating manufacture um, of an SMR re reactor vessel. Um, that works uh, underway, trying to demonstrate you could do that in less than a year. Uh, we're working with a US fabricator. We're actually establishing um, by the end of next year, and that's kind of the picture in the lower right there, um, we will establish um, large scale electron beam welding capability in the United States. So that can be used um, to manufacture these large components. Um, but all told, we're just trying to really think about how we can reinvent this nuclear supply chain. Do you have to have a reinvented nuclear supply chain to build these first plants? You, you do not. You know, I think the supply chain is there for this first fleet. But as we think about those nth of a kind plants and what we can do to really enable the future fleet, um, doing things like reinventing the supply chain, we think, is a, a very important piece. Um, and so with that, I believe that's my last slide, and I can I can stop there. Great timing. Thanks, Craig. Oh, there was one more slide, isn't there? Oh, that's all right. All right. <laughs> Thank you, Craig. Appreciate it. All right. So um, we do have some questions. We'll hold them till the end if we get a chance. But Craig, if you want to take a look at those um, and maybe tackle some of those in the, in the meantime, that'd be great. Thank you. All right. Next up, we have Julianne Edwards. Julianne, are you on? I am. Good morning. Can you hear me okay? Yes. Very good. I guess I should say good afternoon. I'm in Arizona, so I tend to be three <laughs> hours behind everybody. But uh, yeah, nice to meet you guys. And thanks for having me today. And Zach, I'll try to make up some time with my presentation and talking points. Um, so a little bit about myself. I've been in the energy industry for roughly 14 years, started out in commodities, um, shifted then to the talking season, Craig, of small modular reactors when I was with a company called um, Empower out of out of Charlotte, North Carolina. Since it was the talking season, I got out of it when funding ran out from the DOE and gravitated to Chicago Bridge and Iron, which is where I met Jeff Merrifield and had the pleasure of working with him for a number of years. Um, and then now with Energy Solutions. Um, 
And so to talk a little bit about energy solutions, I'll, I'll focus on our assets and resources in the Carolinas based on this panel discussion. But before I do that, just a little company history that folks don't really know about is the company's a growth through acquisition firm. It's been in business for 30 plus years. It was founded in uh, 1988 uh, out of Utah, a company by the name of EnviroCare. Um, from there, several acquisitions such as BNFFL, Duratect, um, eventually got us to rename and uh, rebranding ourselves as Energy Solutions in the roughly 2006 timeframe. A uh, privately held company, we are headquartered in Salt Lake City, Utah, with roughly 1,200 employees uh, worldwide. And revenue streams roughly about half a billion dollars in 2020. Um, but focusing on the Carolinas, um, you know, Charlotte is home to our decommissioning headquarters. And even with COVID over the past two, three years, we have tripled in size out of that location and really drawing on a lot of the skilled talent and knowledgeable talent that's come out of the Carolinas. Um, in that headquarters, our executive staff sits there, our president uh, of our decommissioning group. John Sauger, as well as our CEO and COO, Ken Roebuck and Jeff Richardson. But it's not just decommissioning, it's also one of the headquarters of our operational subdivisions um, related to really nuclear plant services that supports the operating fleet. Um, so with that, a lot of folks also don't know Energy Solution is broken up into two business lines, decommissioning being one um, and operational waste management being the second. So Continuing on with our assets in the Carolinas, supporting our operational waste business is the Barnwell Disposal Facility down in South Carolina. This is a host disposal site that Energy Solutions operates uh, for the Atlantic Compact. So any of the reactors or um, research test facilities that sit in South Carolina, New Jersey, and Connecticut, all of their waste streams do come through uh, the disposal site in South Carolina. Um, it's licensed to dispose of class A, B, and C waste, as well as irradiated hardware and large components. And in addition to the disposal facility, we also have a processing facility uh, in South Carolina, where we really focus on dewatering services, filter, solidification, cast design and support and maintenance. Um, it also has a RECRA permit uh, that's in renewal status right now. Uh, and so. With all of those services, it really kind of sets up our, our sets of assets across the United States that support both operational waste and decommissioning. Um, but speaking more to the purpose of this discussion, which is innovation, um, you know, a common misconception folks have of energy solutions is that we're the Grim Reaper, right? We have a decommissioning business line that's focused on tearing down nuclear plants um, to help kind of uh, Nix that fallacy, uh, I will say that our core business is operational waste, supporting the 90 plus reactors that are in the United States today still operating. Um, but I think it's important to note that to allow for advanced reactors to be deployed, SMRs, you have to finish the entire life cycle of, of nuclear. And that, that also includes decommissioning and making sure that you return that facility to its grassroots um, to allow for that infrastructure, that great asset to be replaced with new technology. So in terms of innovation that we've been applying with um, our company, I'll, I'll focus on the operational waste side. Um, over the past couple of years, we've been putting an emphasis on reducing the you know, radi radiation protection budgets at all these operating plants, like trying to figure out how do we swim upstream and either reduce the amount of waste being generated so that budget can get uh, cut or um, finding new partnerships to help ensure we've integrated all of our services. And so we've deployed and announced in 2020 a partnership with WMG. Um, it's called Total Waste Dispositioning, and we're deploying this across the United States to really help with that concept. It's um, allowing operating utilities to de-risk their sites as much as possible, reduce life cycle cost. Um, and we do that in a number of ways. Um, one that I can speak to is the use of our, we call it our ALP system. Um, it's also deployed out of South Carolina. It's advanced liquid processing system, which is essentially used to improve performance indicators for chemistry, ENPO, and really target liquid um, activity discharge for each plant that is using that system and software. 
Um, but shifting to the decommissioning, which I think is where we're making more strides on innovation. Um, there's so many that we could all talk to and lean on, um, but in the essence of time, two that really stuck out to me is um, one is the use of you know schedule efficiencies when you take the fuel out of the pole and put it onto an asphyxia pad. Back in the late 90s, you would see you know utilities self-performing this task with their OEMs, with their spent fuel canister manufacturers, and taking anywhere from one to two years for this activity. Whereas today, you're seeing on active decommissioning sites that schedule enhancement reducing down to five to six months. And that all results in a huge cost savings to the nuclear decommissioning trust fund, which is essentially more efficient use of ratepayer funds and allowing us to decommission these sites on a quicker time scale. In addition to that, um, something Energy Solutions has been directly involved in is really shifting the contracting models. Again, in the 90s, the, the Yankees, they call it, Maine Yankee, Connecticut Yankee, Yankee Row, you would see that those utilities would self-perform or use more of a um, traditional fixed price contract to you know, take the reactors down, dispose of all the waste, um, and really return the site to a, to a ground state or greenfield state. Um, today, we've seen a huge shift over the past decade where utilities are now wanting to find a way to keep their operational team focused on their core business, which is operating the plant and allowing special purpose entities like energy solutions to take all those lessons learned from project to project and deploy them and even take the license or completely do an asset transfer of that facility. So it really de-risks the utility it really capitalizes on a, a huge knowledge base that sits in the Carolinas, uh, coincidentally, and allows us to, again, have a, the most efficient use of those ratepayer funds. Um, so happy to answer any questions related to our two business lines and you know, innovative ideas that we're trying to deploy into the market. Um, but I think if I could leave you with any thought, it is, you know, think of energy solutions as being that partner that's going to help complete the life cycle so that new reactors can can be deployed in the future at these locations. Thanks, Zach. Thank you, Julianne. All right. Again, if you have questions for Julianne, um, please type them in the chat. And um, if we, we finish in time, we'll be able to review those um, on this call. And if not, Julianne, just please keep an eye on the chat um, in case questions come in and you're able to answer those directly. All right. Thank you very much. Next up, we have Mark Sartain. Mark, are you with us? Yes, I am, Zach. Great. All right. Over to you. All right. Well, thanks very much. And just as all of the other presenters have said today, I'm very happy to be a part of uh, the E4 Carolina session today uh, and really appreciate the invitation to be a part of this particular panel. Uh, one of the challenges with being a late presenter in a session like this is most of what I'm going to say has already been said. But the perspective that I'll bring to the session today is really from a utility standpoint. I'll give you a little bit of background first on Dominion Energy, which is the company that I work for, uh, which I'm sure many of you are familiar with. Dominion Energy is headquartered in Richmond, Virginia, which is where I am and work. Uh, it's a large uh, energy company, primarily an electrical generation, transmission and distribution company, as well as a natural gas distribution company. We employ approximately 17,000 employees and span 16 states in the country, which is really interesting for me. I, I started with the company in 1981 and we were primarily a Virginia utility back in those days and have certainly uh, grown uh, as has our business. Uh, the area that I represent is our nuclear power uh, portion of the company. Uh, we have four operating nuclear stations. Two of those are in the state of Virginia, uh, North Anna and Surrey Power Stations. Uh, we have an operating station in Connecticut right on Long Island Sound, and that's Millstone. And then very happily with the integration that we made with SCANA within the last couple of years, we now have an operating station in South Carolina, VC Summer, Unit 1, uh, near Columbia. 
uh, very not too far from uh, the Westinghouse fuel fab facility that, that Zach talked about a moment ago. We also have a decommissioned facility in Wisconsin, uh, Kiwani, uh, that we unfortunately, due to economics, had to shut down back in 2013, and that facility is going through the decommissioning process. Uh, my particular role as VP of Nuclear Engineering and Fleet Support, all of the engineering staff at each of the four operating stations and at our corporate office report to me. I've also got our regulatory affairs group, which deals with the licensing aspects of nuclear with the NRC, Nuclear Regulatory Commission, and other federal agencies. And I've also got our uh, advanced nuclear program, which really is, has two prongs. It's got our subsequent license renewal effort or second license renewal effort, if you prefer, which is extending the license of the existing fleet. And then also looking at ways that we can take advantage of the advanced nuclear. Uh, very similar to most states in the union, uh, Virginia has enacted legislation promoting the achievement of net zero greenhouse gas emissions. Uh, we in Virginia, that is termed the Virginia Clean Economy Act, VCEA. And it has some very specific directives in it to achieve certain percentages of renewable power generation, whether that's solar, offshore wind, battery technologies, and so forth. But clearly, in order to meet the goals for the, the mid-century net zero uh, greenhouse gas emissions that we're facing, nuclear power is an absolute essential component of that. And the way we see it from the utility perspective is there's really two parallel paths with this. One is the continuation of the operation of the existing fleet. Uh, it's 90 plus reactors in the US and many of them, if not just a, a handful have not, have already applied for and received uh, license renewals that allow each of those stations to operate to 60 years. There's only a couple that have not done that yet that have either already announced uh, closure of the facilities prior to needing that or are just new enough that they haven't needed to to apply for the, the 40 to 60 year extension yet. Uh, we were part of the initial set of lead plants. There were three of us initially a few years ago that embarked on the subsequent license renewal, which is taking the units from 60 to 80 years. Uh, three applications have been reviewed and approved by the NRC already. Uh, our Surrey Power Station in Virginia is one of those that just received its licenses to operate to 2052 and 2053 uh, from the NRC earlier this year in May. We've got an application in with the NRC right now for North Anna Power Station in Virginia, which is about eight years newer than Surrey. Uh, its licenses expire in 2038 and 2040. And we've got, uh, again, the application to extend those an additional 20 years. And just recently, we have begun the early work to pursue subsequent license renewal for VC Summer Unit 1. Uh, it is a couple of years newer than North Anna Unit 2. So it's a logical next step in our process for pursuit of subsequent license renewal. And when we're successful with that, uh, VC Summer will have a license to operate out to 2062. Uh, our, our fourth operating station in Connecticut uh, is a merchant facility. The rest of the units that I just talked about are state regulated entities. And uh, the rules and the, the economics for a merchant plant are a little bit different than they are for a regulated utility. Uh, so we're in the early stages of evaluating uh, what subsequent license renewal might look like for uh, Millstone in Connecticut. Uh, the other parallel path that I mentioned is really the advanced nuclear path. And what you have heard today already from many of the vendors, uh, reactor suppliers and others, is that is also an essential component 
of the clean power future that the states and the nation have and really needs to be a fundamental element of that. And what's really very important from a utility perspective about the advanced nuclear, and in particular, the small modular reactors, is that they are a, an excellent complement to the other renewable energy sources that we're pursuing. I mentioned in Virginia, the Clean Economy Act is, is driving addition of uh, solar development as well as offshore wind. Uh, we have announced some very aggressive plans for increasing the solar capacity in Virginia as well as offshore wind capacity over the next uh, decade. Uh, but even with that aggressive build out, there, there certainly will be some limitations, whether they're uh, geographical, technology, or perhaps even public opinion that might limit the, the amount of build out that solar and offshore wind uh, can contribute. And what fills the, the gap there is really the existing nuclear fleet as well as advanced nuclear reactors. And what's very attractive about the SMRs for us is, as I mentioned, they, they form a great complement to the other renewables. Some of the other presenters today have talked about the duck curve that exists uh, in, in certain uh, daily or weekly uh, progressions of, of the power curves. And where SMRs fit perfectly, because they are dispatchable, because they can load follow much more easily than the large central stations is they can can act uh, in concert with solar and offshore wind when those power sources aren't available in the, at night or when the wind's not blowing uh, having small modular reactors available to fill that time period is just an, an excellent way to achieve the the net zero power or greenhouse gas goals that we we all share some of the other great benefits of uh, this advanced nuclear technology, and you've heard about a number of them from the reactor vendors that were on the previous panel, as well as others, is, but just a few of those that we think from a utility perspective are very important, is the compact design. You've heard from many of the previous uh, uh, presenters that a lot of the technology has improved the safety performance of the, of the designs which has led to less safety related concrete. A lot of the designs are utilized technology that's built basically below grade. Uh, the need for emergency power sources because of some of these inherent safety features that are available is much less. And when you look at the, the benefits of not having as much safety related concrete, not having as much safety related steel, not having the need for very expensive uh, off-site or on-site uh, power generation sources. All of that rolled together makes for a very compact design that not only improves the overall cost picture for those units, but it also decreases the size of the emergency planning zone that exists around our stations. Many of the large stations I uh, have five mile and 10 mile emergency planning zones around the plants that we have to uh, protect against some of the, the more significant events. With the fact that these new designs can eliminate some of these potential uh, accident scenarios that need to be designed for and ultimately can shrink the emergency planning zones. And in some cases, it could be just uh, the fence that surrounds the facility Obviously, great benefit uh, to the public from that. Uh, also, from a, a security force perspective, it could be reduced. But just any number of, of benefits are, are available to us from a utility perspective that all lead to one of the very, one of the most important aspects of it is that the cost of these advanced nuclear facilities must be competitive with the other forms of generation that we are all evaluating, whether that's solar, uh, offshore wind, onshore wind, solar plus storage, the overnight uh, capital cost for these stations, as well as, as the LCOE uh, for the facilities has absolutely got to be competitive. And I think you heard each of the, the four uh, technology vendors talk about that as being fundamental 
uh, to uh, them delivering their product to market. Uh, just the, the final thing that I'll say about that is uh, there, there is also a lot of dialogue at the federal level within uh, Congress, uh, from the White House, from the Department of Energy on uh, programs that will provide uh, incentives to continuing not only the, the existing nuclear fleet, but as well as the advanced nuclear program. You've heard all several of the, the participants mention the uh, DOE advanced reactor demonstration program and other programs that are funding these new technologies. Absolutely critical that those programs get funded and there is really great support uh, within all those legislative entities to continue that. They all realize the value that clean nuclear power brings to the entire picture. And uh, what, what's most important about this is really the diversity of our power sources. Having nuclear be a component, as well as solar, offshore wind, battery storage technology, and all the other technologies that are yet to be determined uh, provide for us meeting these net zero goals with a, a, a very diverse source of power. So uh, that really concludes my remarks and certainly at the end of our session, I'll be happy to answer any questions. Thanks, Zach. Yeah, thank you, Mark. All right, again, there's a couple questions that came in, uh, Mark, so if you're able to take a look at those and uh, we may be able to get to those at the end, but uh, not looking promising. <laughs> All right, next up, Chris Nolan. Uh, Chris, are you on with us? I am, and thank you very much for having me. I'm excited to speak to this community. If you could go to the slide presentation. Um, next slide, please. So uh, I'm the Vice President of Regulatory Affairs Policy and Emergency Preparedness. I have advanced reactors reporting to me. I've been with Duke for about 15 years. Prior to that, I was uh, uh, with the Nuclear Regulatory Commission in the new reactors uh, office just before I came to, to Duke. and. Before that, I was at Calvert Cliffs for 10 years in engineering. I was in the, I was in prototype operations in the Navy program at the Vols Atomic Power Lab. And I started my career um, with Bechtel Power on the Three Mile Island Unit 2 recovery project. So uh, I've seen the industry from a bunch of different perspectives, but, but, but I'm here to talk about Duke, not myself. So if you look at the first slide in the center figure, you show, uh, I'm showing our Carolina service territory. We have 11 units at six sites uh, spread across the Carolinas. And in the right-hand side, you'll see uh, the additional states that Duke Energy operates in, Florida, Tennessee, Kentucky, Ohio, and Indiana. Um, and so I'm gonna give you both a fleet and an enterprise picture on the next slide. So this is just a snapshot of our nuclear fleet in 2020. Uh, we had a combined 94.4% capacity factor which represents 22 consecutive years above 90%. Uh, but more importantly, we avoided 50 million tons of CO2. We employed nearly 5,000 employees and serviced 8 million homes in the area. Next slide. And, and trying to present Duke Energy now and in the future, and, and we are now talking about enterprise-wide numbers. Um, I, I use this figure, it's from our integrated resource plan. Uh, and, and really what it shows is, is how we're trying to achieve our, uh, our, our, our carbon reduction goals. So we have a goal of a 50% reduction by 2030. We're well on our way of, of, of beating that target. And then a net zero uh, carbon goal of 2050, uh, which will be uh, a, a much bigger lift to achieve. And so how, how are we meeting our 2030 goal? So, so we're doing it by reducing our dependence on coal, increasing our reliable um, our, our reliance on variable renewables, hydrogen pump storage, um, and, uh, and um, solar mostly. And, uh, and we're uh, continuing the safe operation of our nuclear fleet and we're expanding our use of gas. And gas has provided tremendous value to our customers by uh, keeping rates low and reducing our carbon footprint. And, and our customers in the Carolinas care about the environment very much, but they're focused on cost as well. And, um, and so we have found tremendous value in that mix in, in meeting our 2030 climate goals. Uh, but when you get to 2050, um, you have to move away um, from natural gas. And so if you, if you look at our, our 2050 target, uh, um, continued operation of the nuclear fleet is essential. 
Uh, you see the expansion of renewables, uh, wind, solar, mostly. And then this term called Zelfer, which is a zero admitting, low following resource. And, and nuclear is, is primed to take that role. Um, and some of the advanced nuclear designs um, really, really fit in that well. But there's other things that are looking to fill that role as well. And, and, and whether it's uh, storage in the form of a battery or thermal storage or, or hydrogen. And so, so really, you know, it, it's upon us as an industry to, to be the best solution for the customers to meet that role or, or some other technology will take it. But, but in 2050, it's about the same size as our existing fleet. Next slide. So, so, so Mark did a great job of, about talking about subsequent license renewal, and and, and this is just a figurine. Uh, the 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 blue shaded region shows um, the energy production of the existing fleet under its current licenses. If everyone in the industry goes for subsequent license renewal, it, it extends the operations, which is the the pink shaded area, and and that's very important for a number of reasons, right? It 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 keeps the infrastructure going in terms of university programs, um, supply chain, uh, skilled, knowledgeable workers, licensed operators. And so, um, you know, the, the future of advanced reactors is very much a springboard off the existing fleet. And so subsequent license renewal is, is a critical uh, element and, and it is part of our strategy to, to hit net zero for our entire fleet. Next slide. And, and, and this is my last slide, and, and really it, 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 uh, it's a complex discussion uh, that, it, that, that is tried to, to, to be embodied in an idea. And so, so variable renewables are, are a great way to provide carbon-free energy, but, but they, they on, in and of themselves cannot meet the needs of a grid that is 24-7 and, and important to public health and safety. And so, um, so we need to pair those variable renewables with 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 flexible base load power, we call it flexible dispatchable power, and um, and, and so um, com combining nuclear with things like thermal storage and hydrogen allows them to pair better with uh, wind and solar that are variable, so that we can maximize the penetration of wind and solar and maximize the the value of nuclear. And so the Department of Energy has. Uh, the ARDP program, and we heard about X Energy uh, earlier. They're one of the, uh, the the award recipients. Terra Power is another one, and and that's a liquid sodium plant with a molten salt storage loop. And so we're a team member on that because uh, because we're looking to learn. And and I listed who the team members are, and there's there's some 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 very familiar names: Bechtel, G. Itachi, Global Nuclear Fuels, NC State, um, and so. Uh, you know, the, the demonstration plan is, is targeted for Wyoming, which is uh, uh, at a retired coal plant. We heard that theme earlier that Pacific Corp um, owns. And so, uh, you know, our interest in this is, 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 is learning and, and preparing ourselves to the future when it's time to pivot. But, but, but advanced technologies that operate at higher temperatures and lower pressures are, are more economical, they're safer, and they can pair with other, can, and we can pair them with other technologies such as um, thermal storage or hydrogen generation to maximize the value of nuclear and variable renewables like wind and solar. So, 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 so that is what I had to offer today. And if there's any questions in the chat, um, you know, I'll, I'll, I'll see how we can get a follow-up response to them. So thank you. Great, thank you, Chris, appreciate it. All right. Um, so we do have a few questions from chat and we actually have about five minutes. Uh, so we'll um, go ahead and start uh, off one quick question for Mark and Chris. Um, when we're looking at these advanced reactor implementation, um, specifically for this in the Carolinas, um, I know you have decarbonization goals you both mentioned. Uh, in order to get there, where is the location uh, that you see for these advanced nuclear reactors? Do you have the Carolinas targeted? Um, for a site for for one of these advanced reactors, and if so, what what timeline are we looking at for potential installation there? You know, I I can offer a, an answer to that first. Uh, right now, our focus is in the state of Virginia, so we have just begun 
the very preliminary work on evaluating technologies as well as potential site locations. And we will absolutely evaluate existing nuclear stations in Virginia as potential sites for SMRs. We will also evaluate, uh, like a number of other facilities have had to do, uh, the, the coal stations that have been retired uh, because of the infrastructure around those, the, whether that's transmission, water, what have you, makes for an ideal location to potentially site uh, SMR. We'll also look at partnerships with military facilities that exist in the state of Virginia, uh, as well as other, uh, even greenfield sites potentially. So our, our initial work is in Virginia. It's, it's certainly reasonable to think that that could expand at a later date. And just, just for Duke Energy, so, so we have service territories both within the Carolinas and outside, and of course we're looking at all of them. Um, our our plans are in place to achieve our goals by by mid 2030. I mean, but but our 50% reduction by 2030. When we continue to add on additional um, generation through solar, and so really mid 2035 is when we're looking for um, you know um, to bring advanced nuclear online in the system. Um, but there a lot has to happen between now and then, and. And, and 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 a lot of of community and in government engagement, right? So it's mm -hmm. it's uh, it's not just a decision that you make in isolation. And so, uh, um, I guess I guess the key word that we have is optionality. We're we're looking at our options, not looking to deploy. Great. Yeah. Thank you, Chris. Thank you, Mark. Appreciate that. Um, jumping over to Craig. So one interesting question came up. I, I think there was some interest in the. Um, discussion that you had on the uh, to build a reactor factory. So um, that seems uh, pretty interesting and pretty ambitious. So uh, one of the questions in here was how many orders would it need for that to make sense? Um, I'm sure you don't have the specific number that you're you're ready to share, but um, is that timing aligned with uh, one of those answers from Mark and Chris for the timing for the advanced reactor implementation? Um, and does it require uh, kind of a down select of a single reactor design, or would that um, manufacturing site have the capabilities to produce uh, structures for uh, the different reactor designs that are are being evaluated right now? Yeah, I mean, I think that's a I think it's a really good question. Um, one of the things we talk a lot about is you know the order book, so to speak. Everybody says you know you, you need an you need an order book of reactors to, to really increase the competitiveness of so many of these designs. Um, and honestly, I don't have the best answer because we spend a lot of time debating this very issue about it's a supply chain um, economics game of at what point does somebody stand up and build the facility? Um, what I will say is there's a lot of different things on the table. First of all, you have multiple design, you know, multiple designs on the, t the table. Some of them have multiple reactors. Um, you know, so the different business models and business cases have an impact. Um, and then there's also approaches of maybe instead of a reactor vendor building a factory, it's somebody like a manufacturer that builds a facility to build multiple designs in one place. So I think there's a number of variables out there, but certainly, you know, from an investment standpoint, I think when we see multiple utilities step forward, you know, with commitments to build reactors, um, I think the market will take over at that point. Yes, thank you, Craig. All right, and we finished right on time. Uh, appreciate everyone for presenting and the questions that came in. Um, with that, I will turn it over for the last segment of um, this conference. So supporting the next generation of nuclear workforce in the Carolinas. And I believe the, the next presenter is uh, uh, Mr. David Doctor. Are you there, David? I'm here. All right, great. There we go. Now I'm here uh, visually also. So there you uh, go. thank you, Jess. So I'm going to provide a little bit of context for where we are, and I'm going to give you an introduction to a project that E4 Carolinas has been very fortunate to receive and have initiated. And uh, then I'm going to leave you for uh, my computer over here, which uh, 
already is in progress with another session that I'm to be attending. So I'm going to hand things off to Dr. Lucas Brune in just a couple of minutes. So the context, as, as we hit the turn of the century, and it, and it seems interesting to say the turn of the century, but that's what it was, uh, in the period 2000 through 2000, say, eight or so, our, our fuel choices for generating power were primarily coal, natural gas, nuclear, and then a little bit of hydro, which is steady state. By that point, coal was already under pressure with regard to uh, pollution. <clears throat> natural gas was experiencing uh, abnormally high prices compared to the past two uh, decades of history. And nuclear was the evident choice for utilities wanting to continue to renew their uh, power generating fleet and also to expand. 2008, the Carolina Nuclear Cluster was formed as an ad hoc organization, about 100 plus companies and organizations. And these, these were companies and organizations with a nuclear interest based in the Carolinas or having nexus with the Carolinas. And they felt that we were on the verge of a nuclear renaissance. In 2011, we had the Fukushima nuclear plant incident. Shortly after that, E4 Carolinas was formed. We uh, incorporated the Carolinas nuclear cluster into our operation. And about 2014, we saw natural gas prices begin to decline and stay low for a long period of time. 2009, interestingly, was the uh, first significant amounts of solar and wind that appeared. There, there was no consequential solar or wind beyond that. And we saw a huge surge in both solar and wind. So at that point, nuclear became relatively unattractive to utilities. In 2016, E4 Carolinas, with the support of the Nuclear Energy Institute, inventoried about 150 plus Carolina nuclear companies and organizations. So still a very large operating base in the Carolinas. The two nuclear projects under construction in the US uh, remained the VC Summer Plant and the Vogel Plant down in Georgia. In 2017, the VC Summer Project was canceled. We lost about 5,400 construction jobs, and I think there were estimated about 600 full-time jobs that were lost. <clears throat> the MOX plant the next year was canceled by the U.S. Department of Energy. We lost 2,000 construction jobs, and again, also about 600 permanent jobs. <clears throat> now, to next slide, please. To set into perspective what we have with regard to <clears throat> the generating capacity in the region, you've got this uh, slide here that identifies a number of reactors. We have 26 reactors out of the uh, uh, 98 reactors that were recorded at this time in the United States. So we have a little bit more than 26% of the total generating fleet in these five states, North Carolina, South Carolina, Georgia, uh, Tennessee, and Virginia. You see also that not only number of units, but the capacity, we have about the same amount, 26%. So we have a concentration of nuclear generating capacity in the Southeast. And along with that, we have service companies <clears throat> and suppliers <clears throat> that are concentrated here also. Next slide, please. This slide is, is uh, derived from a table in a 2016 Clemson study <clears throat> that focused on the economic impact of nuclear in the Carolinas. And, what, and, and this was just the Carolinas, it wasn't the uh, other three surrounding states, Virginia, Tennessee, and Georgia. And I'll direct your attention down to the total line. It's the second one from the bottom. <clears throat> and what you see there, when you go all the way over to the right to the total, is more than $10 billion in total value annually that's produced by just the nuclear plants, the nuclear generating plants that are in our two states, North Carolina and South Carolina, the associated original equipment manufacturers and fuel suppliers, the engineering, procurement, and construction companies that continue to support them, and then other ancillary suppliers, 10 billion plus annually. And you look down the bottom line, you can see the employment of all these related to the Carolina nuclear plants is nearly 14,000. <clears> when you think through on a per plant basis, what we have here, the uh, value is about a billion dollars a year in uh, annual value, and that's a uh, property, sales taxes, uh, payroll taxes, et cetera, that uh, are realized by these local units of government. Every Carolina nuclear plant worker generates about $90,000 
in direct economic value and a like amount, another $90,000 in indirect economic value as a result of them uh, expending that $90,000 in the economy. <clears throat> so you can see that despite the fact that we've had two plants canceled in South Carolina, and despite the fact that, that nuclear has been in a holding action for a period of time, it still represents very substantial economic value to the Carolinas. Next slide, please. With that thought in mind, and with the experience that we had with the cancellation of the VC summer plant and the MOX plant in 2017 and 2018, a number of companies and organizations combined with E4 Carolinas to apply to the Economic Development Administration in <clears throat> late 2020 for a grant to develop over the course of three years to conduct research, analysis, assessment, and then to create a plan for economic development of advanced nuclear technologies in this five state region, Virginia, North Carolina, South Carolina, Tennessee, and Georgia. The grant was awarded on May 27th of this year. It extends through the end of June in 2024. So we have three years to do this work. The total grants about one and a quarter, one and three quarter million dollars. 80% of it is federal funds. 20% is generated locally. Uh, we have to uh, we have to generate one dollar of value for every four dollars of federal funds that we get, and this local cost share is generated as a result of the 42 different companies and organizations that are collaborating with E4 Carolinas to undertake this effort in donating their time. So the value of that time credits that 20%. We'll spend about $800,000 with various contractors. The contract was awarded under the CARES Act. That's why we have the uh, very generous cost share amount. Typically it's 50-50. And the EDA found that the economic disruption caused by the VC summer plant cancellation and the MOX plant cancellation warranted their funding of this planning. We define advanced nuclear technologies generally, and this is a work in progress, as advanced technologies that will uh, uh, support new generation, but also, uh, also uh, support the plant life extension of our existing fleet. Year one will be research and inventory, year two, assessment, drafting the plan, year three is completion of the plan, and then education of various stakeholders in this five state area. And those stakeholders are gonna include policymakers, economic developers, communities, environmental organizations, various suppliers. <clears throat> we have uh, 51 companies and organizations collaborating at this point. We have the nine universities in that five street region that are engaged in nuclear research and nuclear education are all collaborators. And while we've identified 51 companies and organizations, the invitation is open. And we have about another 100 companies and organizations in the region that we know have a nuclear energy interest. And we have and we will continue to extend invitations. So if any of you are viewing right now, if you have an interest in the nuclear industry, your company or organization operates in that space, you're not involved with this project, you can be in touch with me or Dr. Lucas Brune and we'll explain to you how you can be involved in this project for the next three years. So now it's my pleasure to move the program over to Dr. Lucas Brun. Lucas is our Managing Director of Research and Economic Development. He joined E4 Carolinas informally in January. We uh, put him on the payroll in June and he comes to us from Duke University. So Lucas, I'm gonna step away from the platform and I'm gonna turn the program over to you. Thank you very much. Oh, by the way, these slides that you've seen, there will be yours uh, through email sometime next week, at least uh, my and Lucas's deck. Thank you all. Great. Thank you, David, and thank you for that um, overview of um, our activity at E4 Carolinas uh, related to uh, advanced nuclear technologies. Um, just a quick reflection before I go through my slides. Um, I thought the conversation today was was excellent, and in particular, the, the last comment made by, by Chris about you know, the need for engaging uh, communities and governments around uh, advanced nuclear technologies, particularly when we get to the, the siting uh, piece of, of this um, discussion, I think is, is really important. There's a lot of work to be done there. Uh, one of the purposes of this awarded grant is to begin doing exactly that, to begin doing the community and government engagement, 
uh, to identify kind of leverage points in order uh, to see where the future for advanced nuclear technologies uh, deployment um, in our region uh, is, you know, the, the chance that it would happen. Um, and I also mentioned another piece of it. So the, I think the siting piece of it is, is important, but also just the economic development piece of it. As David mentioned, there are a number of companies that are critical to the economy of North and South Carolina and, and our neighboring states. And um, because the nuclear industry is a global industry, uh, I think there's a tremendous amount of opportunity to continue uh, having uh, and expanding the number of global lead firms that are in our region uh, for um, achieving economic development in the North Carolina area, South Carolina area, and our region. Uh, but then also to expand those opportunities for markets that are, uh, present themselves globally. So what I'm here today to talk about is just uh, the Advanced Nuclear Technologies uh, grant that we received from the Economic Development Administration. Uh, next slide, please. Um, as David mentioned, uh, the first year is really going to be uh, conducting research, uh, and the research is going to be uh, doing a value chain uh, approach. We're going to be inventorying uh, companies uh, in the second part of the first year. Uh, then we'll do an assessment of how that research and inventory uh, works, develop a plan draft, and then year three is really uh, testing and implementation and socialization of the plan. And throughout that, uh, we have two task forces, uh, advisory councils that will be part of this. One is the Industry Advisory Council. David mentioned and extended invitations to anybody who is interested in participating in that advisory council. Uh, and then we also have a faculty advisory council with the area universities um, that have uh, a nuclear footprint. And our goal is really to create uh, a, a set of industry and um, academic uh, educational uh, resources and to be able to socialize and get comfortable with uh, being in a room with each other and talking about uh, where the nuclear uh, deployment uh, is going in our region, but also what the opportunities are for economic development uh, in our region going forward. Next slide. Um, so uh, I come from Duke University where I was uh, a project manager and researcher for the Global Value Chain Center. Uh, we have uh, developed over the past uh, couple of decades uh, a global value chain framework. And so this project really uses and leverages that analysis. Um, and you'll see in this slide the kind of the, the steps that we do that. Uh, and so the first part is defining the technologies. Today's discussion where people presented about different types of advanced nuclear reactors was very helpful. Um, and we'll continue to uh, define what uh, those technologies are. I think um, one of the things that we're also really interested in is the um, information and communication technology piece of it, the big data the IOT uh, that might be associated with advanced nuclear technologies, and then also the waste management piece of it, I think is, is really important to, to also address. Uh, we'll create a value chain, value chain map of um, what uh, the industry uh, looks like, and then we'll begin to add data layers uh, related to technologies, uh, global lead firms, and U.S. companies in the region. Uh, we'll convene that report uh, as, as we write it uh, and have uh, ways to socialize that um, that report where uh, people will understand uh, what we've been up to and, and kind of uh, be able to uh, provide um, input and comments, uh, and then we'll provide some recommendations and we'll repeat that process because it's not just a linear uh, process where you uh, write recommendations, but you have to listen and write uh, at the same time um, and in steps. Uh, next slide, please. Um, so in terms of what we'll be doing, uh, that's the, the, the port of E4 Carolinas. Uh, we have project partners that will be a part of this. Uh, we'll be updating the economic impact analysis. We'll be updating the workforce requirements and skills assessments, and we'll uh, begin doing the community engagement piece of it, uh, measuring uh, attitudinal measures of community policymakers, interest organizations, economic development and commerce departments in the states uh, that are affected by this grant. Um, and uh, I, I say that we hope to do this because everything is subject to contracting, but um, we're well on our way to identifying uh, research partners uh, to do those three components of, of this grant. Next slide, please. 
Um, so this is a project schedule, probably too small for you to see, but um, you know, it, it provides just an overview of, of how we uh, are going to uh, be progressing through this grant. Uh, basically, there's the research component, uh, there's the contract research part, and then there's the you know management of relationships piece of it. Uh, and you see that um, we have quarterly uh, reporting requirements uh, there in, in orange, uh, and the project will flow throughout uh, the next uh, three years, uh, ending in May 22. That's all I've got in terms of slides presentation. Um, if we want to return it back to uh, the overview uh, or um, moderating so we can address maybe some additional questions uh, that have been posed throughout the course of this session. We looks like we have maybe 15 minutes uh, that we can uh, have that discussion among uh, the people who are still here. Uh, so, Zachary, I guess I'll, I'll turn it back over to you. Lucas, thank you so much. I am not sure that we have Zachary with us still, um, but we certainly appreciate the opportunity to hear in detail about the work that E4 Carolinas is doing to support this next generation of nuclear existence, I guess is the best way to say it, not just workforce, but technology as well. And I am scrolling quickly to see if toward the end, we have Lucas's information here and ask everyone to be sure to keep an eye on the E4 Carolinas website for our upcoming events. We have in particular from the South Carolina Clean Energy Industries Task Force, we're beginning to plan our 2021 South Carolina Clean Energy Conference and Southeastern Energy Law Seminar. They are going to take place, the conference on December 9th and the Continuing Legal Education Seminar on December 10th. And they will be held physically in Greenville, South Carolina, provided we are able to meet in an in-person fashion at that time. We are exploring the ability to present both the conference and the continuing legal education seminar via live stream concurrently with the event. Um, Jessica, who has been our trusted IT support throughout this conference, is going to have an opportunity, we believe, to test out her dual hosting in person and live streaming skills at the end of October for E4 Carolina's annual meeting, which will be in Charlotte. Again, you can find information about that on our event website. And between now and those events, from the South Carolina Clean Energy Industries Task Force perspective, we have invited Santee Cooper, the South Carolina Public Service Authority, to join us for an update on what's taking place within that organization, both operationally, in terms of energy overall, in terms of clean energy, in terms of transitions that they will be having on their board based on legislation that was adopted in the South Carolina legislature last year. That is going to be on September 10th, and we will open registration for that early next week. Thank you all so very much for being with us. We will, Jeff, I see you come back off um, hidden video and mute. So I'm assuming you'd like to add a couple of words. Yes, if I, if I may, and thank you very much. First, I wanna, uh, Bonnie, thank you, um, all of our panelists and all of the staff of E4 Carolina for putting together what is clearly an excellent presentation. Uh, I hope you all have learned a lot about advanced nuclear technologies. Uh, and if you've got further questions, uh, feel free to reach out to me or others uh, who are on the panels today. I'm sure all of us would be happy uh, to engage and help. Um, it would be inappropriate for me as chairman of E4 Carolinas not to conclude with mentioning, we think this is the kind of high value content that we bring uh, to our members. Uh, we have a variety of training uh, opportunities that are available, whether it's our boot camp or leadership development. And lots of very active opportunities for our members uh, to partner, uh, to collaborate, and to help drive economic development uh, for the two-state area in which we find ourselves. Uh, last, for those of you who may not 
yet be members of E4, um, we would like to have you join us. So please uh, think about that. Uh, either reach out directly to David Doctor, Bonnie, or others. Uh, we have an incredible lineup of, of members uh, who are here in the Carolinas and beyond, and certainly want you to be part of that as well. With that, Bonnie, uh, thank you. I'll turn it back to you and wish everyone a good weekend. Thank you, David. And I am going, I mean, thank you, Jeff. And I am going to tag on to that and uh, let everyone know that we are um, very much looking for sponsors for our upcoming conference. And if you are new to E4 Carolinas, um, we would like to offer you the opportunity in particular to do a bit of a double dip and get a membership along with sponsorship acknowledgement for the conference. So please be sure to reach out to us in that regard. So thank you all again. We are great. Um, we, we appreciate everyone being with us today and hope that everyone has a very safe and happy weekend. Thank you.